Good afternoon. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting this afternoon uh, with the president of the VSEA and the executive director of the Vermont NEA and uh, looking forward to hearing their thoughts and reactions to, um, to the bill draft that we have been uh, considering this week. Um, the goal of the bill draft was really to be responsive to what we heard from the many um, teachers and state employees who came to our public hearings um, and who have also contacted us through their own representatives in the in the Vermont House um, who said we need to slow down, we need to um, take time to look at all of the aspects of, uh, of the pension system. Um, and so the bill setting up uh, a summer task force and uh, uh, and also incorporating some of the consensus governance changes that we think will help um, improve the performance of our uh, investment side is the draft that we are seeking uh, responses from these folks on today. So um, I think we'll go first to Jeff Fannin. Thank you, Jeff, for being with us today and uh, please share your, uh, your thoughts with us. All right, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And, and, uh... Good afternoon, committee. Um, my name is Jeff Fannin. I'm the executive director of Vermont NEA, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about the draft bill um, uh, concerning the Vermont Pension Investment Committee, VPIC, and the Pension Design and Funding Task Force, um, otherwise known as the Task Force, the Summer Task Force. Uh, we appreciate this process is slowing down, as you just mentioned, um, and it, as was the case in 2010 and 2014, we uh, will continue to, to participate in this process because maintaining a strong defined benefit plan uh, for our pension, for our teachers is critical for our students and communities, we believe. I have several specific observations and a general comment about the draft bill. Uh, as a general matter, I think the bill, excuse me, the draft lacks balance. And balance by, by that, I mean, uh, balance between the plan participants and other interested parties. Uh, for example, the troopers are not mentioned anywhere and should be, I think. Uh, the recent public hearings and outpouring of, of comments that you just previously mentioned, Madam Chair, uh, from planned participants demonstrated a genuine need for fairness in the process, including VPIC and the task force, so that any recommendations have buy-in from those affected by the proposed changes. Uh, balance, therefore, must be achieved. So as, as it relates to VPIC, uh, we have several concerns and, and highlights that I'll bring to your attention. First, increasing the size of VPIC from seven to 10 dilutes the voices of the three planned participants on the committee. And as I mentioned on March 25th, when I testified uh, to you um, about the earlier proposal on governance, uh, the current composition of VPIC is perfectly in line with the recommendations of the Boston College Center on Retirement Research. Among other concerns raised by that group, uh, adding political appointees to the committee as the draft does now is, current, is likely to diminish investment returns, exactly what we don't wanna do. So uh, according to the BC research, uh, we recommend uh, the governor's appointees should be reduced to one, the commissioner of finance and management. It's also unclear why the VPIC chair has a 20 year term limit. Uh, oftentimes board members, uh, are accused of becoming too cozy with board advisors, their consultants and staff. And we think therefore, um, uh, and what happens then is they fail to ask the critical questions that are really necessary as a board member. Uh, so we think the chair should have the same 12 year term as all other members. Um, and of course, you know, there's a cycle to that, I understand, but that, that ought to be included. Um, the draft lacks a removal section, which we think is critical. The committee must have the ability to remove a member in cases of malfeasance or other egregious acts. Minus such removal language, a VPIC member could overstay uh, his or her welcome and possibly harm the committee and its work. So I think we think the draft needs a removal section. Uh, additionally, we recommend it proposed section 523D policies, adding a simple word written in the first sentence as follows the committee shall formulate written policies and procedures. I'm concerned that it may be perceived as ambiguous and we ought to remove that ambiguity. 
Um, as for the task force, again, as, as above, we think the task force lacks balance, which is absolutely critical to convey fairness. We believe the composition of the task force must be revised to include greater participant voice. That's a tough one for me, sorry. Um, there are we don't understand the rational reasons to include a member of the business community when the plans are all public sector plans and not private sector plans. It's notable, however, that the private sector plans are governed by ERISA, which requires of collectively bargained plans to include an equal number of employees and employers on their boards. So notwithstanding the private sector's requirement for balance, the business community we believe members should be removed from the task force. And likewise, the commissioner of DFR should be removed. Again, regardless of position or affiliation, the balance of the task force must, be, must include an equal number of employee and management representatives to achieve fairness and integrity of any possible recommendation. Uh, I, in summary, I guess you could say this could be achieved by adding to Vermont and EA, VSEA and, and the Troopers Association's appointees or subtracting from the employer side. It doesn't, uh, it just, but to achieve balance, that's gotta be accomplished. The charge of the, of the task force, specifically recruitment and retention. We're hearing, as you did earlier in your public hearings, uh, the concern over recruitment and retention of teachers and state employees. On the teacher side, there already is a teacher shortage in Vermont. And just yesterday, the Secretary of Education, Dan French, spoke in the Senate Education Committee about the concerns with the shortage of qualified educators in Vermont. The task force should examine the effects of current benefit structures and contribution characteristics on the recruitment and retention of public school educators and state employees and evaluation of any proposed changes to current benefit structures and contribution characteristics on the recruitment and retention of public school educators and state employees in the future. Uh, the impact on other state benefits. Um, I remember this, but in the early 2000s, many retired teacher uh, pensions uh, were so small that the state had to step in and unilaterally increase teachers' pensions to get such retirees off public assistance programs. And I worry that we're, we're heading down that path again. So we should, in, this task force should evaluate proposed changes to current benefit structures and contribution characteristics on the pre-retirement and post-retirement welfare and financial security of public school educators and state employees who identify as female or BIPOC and public school educators and state employees, irrespective of their identity, who earn less than the federal poverty level during their years of active employment and during their retirement. <clears throat> Underfunding. Uh, we hear a lot of discussion about this and I think it's, it, uh, it's well documented that the teacher system was underfunded dramatically from 1979 through 2006, except for four years. And that's an alarming achievement, frankly. And this underfunding is clearly dis displayed by the fact that the teacher system is underfunded more significantly when compared to the state employees, if you just look at their funding ratios, which are 66 in the state employees and 50% for the teachers. The task force should conduct an actuarial in-depth assessment of the annual investment returns estimated to have been lost to the teacher system and the impact of those losses. Uh, dedicated revenue and one-time funds. So the teachers and state employees have put in every penny ever required of them by law. And while we appreciate the state has paid the full ADAC, at least in the teacher system since 2007 and always for the state employees, the underfunding of the teacher system cannot be disregarded. Uh, for this reason, among others, the task force should in investigate funding and revenue enhancements, including contributions from the state, municipalities and monies generated from the increased taxes on the wealthiest Vermonters, including individuals, businesses, and other potential revenue sources. Additionally, the state should use at least the previously discussed and mentioned $150 million in one-time funds towards the pensions. The federal stimulus funds have been a proverbial shot in the uh, economic arm of the state, and using these, state, these increased revenues to begin to shore up the pensions is the, we think is the best use of the dollars. Can bless you, Madam Chair. Um, the intersection with healthcare costs um, are real. One of the buckets often discussed, mostly by the governor, is the teacher's OPEB bucket, OPEB bucket other post-employment benefits, and that's healthcare. We think the task force should examine and study the health benefit designs, innovations, state regulatory measures, and other alternative measures, models of providing pooled health insurance to both active and retired school employees to lower healthcare costs for employees, retirees, school boards, and the state, 
and drive those savings into the pension. Economic analysis. Uh, the task force must evaluate the intermediate and long-term economic effects to the state and local economies because of any proposed changes to current benefit structures and contribution characteristics and their potential effects on retiree spending power, which is sizable. <clears throat> and finally, we think the task force's uh, timeline seems overly and unnecessarily aggressive and the report should be delivered on or before October 15 to allow for some genuine analysis and consideration by the task force. Uh, we think a hastily drafted report will only cause more harm and anger amongst those possibly affected by the recommendations in the report. So with that, I'll stop and happy to answer any questions. My written comments are afforded to Andrea earlier. And I thank you for that. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you for being with us um, and also for submitting <clears throat> your comments in writing. It'll help for us to be able to go back and, and review them after we've um, had a little bit of conversation. So. Uh, committee, I will give you an opportunity to ask any <clears throat> any questions. Rep McCarthy. Uh, Jeff, thanks for being with us and and coming with some suggestions for us as we're we're doing this difficult work. Um, I guess I want to go to your point and ask you a little bit about um, the frame that you're viewing the balance question through. And I've been looking a lot uh, at the frame of the balance between expertise and those who are, who are amateurs on VPIC specifically. So I'm gonna set the task force aside for a second, really just think about the investments. And I'm wondering if you could comment on, you know, some of the feedback we got from your members at the public hearings, which said, you know, that their, their confidence was really shook in, the state's management of their funds, the state's management of their funds, we heard again and again. And, and I think a lot of those folks who, who talked to us were really frustrated, not with the legislature's management of their funds, but with the way that their funds have been invested, weren't performing, uh, you know, and the pressure that that was putting on us and them in, in this difficult question of how we save the pension. So I'm wondering if you can comment on you know, this balance between amateur versus expertise on VPIC moving forward. Okay, um, thank you. So I, I wouldn't call them amateurs. I, I think some of the, the plan participant uh, people on these boards are, are very experienced. They've received, a, they've been there for some amount of time and, and uh, the tenure, um, for example, on the chair, uh, I, I address saying, uh, I don't think they should have a 20 year term. I think they should have a 12 year term along with everybody else. So I think, you know, Getting the rolling, the cycle, you know, the staggered terms is important for everybody to have background, knowledge, and education as they go forward. So you constantly have a churn, but you also have a constant stable set of people who are very knowledgeable. So I, I don't know that I necessarily agree with the term amateurs, but certainly these are folks who get up to speed, work hard, and their interests are, frankly, in the preservation of the plan itself or their, perhaps their own benefit but for their colleagues' benefit as, as well. So I think they have, the, they have the, a very good sense of what's right and wrong and what, how to proceed, I would say. And they finally, they also, um, all of these folks are receiving the advice of investment experts in the VPIC context. So the state pays a lot of money to investment ex experts and has for many years. And uh, I think even if you had... Uh, a financial background on Wall Street, you might ask some critical questions, but those come with knowing the plan and understanding the needs of the plan, I, I would say. And it's not just, you know, I think we shouldn't invest in this company or that company. Uh, those are investment advisor decisions, I think, and they make recommendations that uh, any board member, whether they're so-called expert or amateur, as you described them, would be hard pressed to go against. And, and then that goes to, I think that the, the the fiduciary roles that they all play and stepping aside and stepping outside of that fiduciary role and rejecting an investment advisor's recommendation. I think they had to have really good reason to do so. And I think that um, anybody who's got enough education and most of the board members all do, and given that the fact that they'd be on BPIC for 12 years, I think they would get it if they don't have it immediately, um, I think would be equipped to answer those questions and ask those critical questions. So I think that the, the answer to your question really is they're not amateurs. 
everybody starts off with a level of ignorance of the plan when they arrive, no matter what their baseline is and how they arrive. It's about getting education once they do arrive and making them uh, knowledgeable about the plan and, to, and sorting through the investment advice they get from the, the Wall Street experts, if you will. Well, thanks, Jeff. If I could just follow up, Madam Chair, you bring up an interesting thing, which is do, do the members of VPIC now who represent the boards uh, not coming from you know, uh, a level of financial expertise. I know some of them have had some outside training and I appreciated some of the testimony received on that, but it strikes me that if an investment advisor came to them, a professional with bad advice, would they be able to look through the numbers and the advice that they were being given to, to see through that? And I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm an amateur, I'm not a financial expert, but it strikes me that some of the decisions that VPIC has to make uh, could easily be, uh, the advice that they get could easily be shrouded in a whole bunch of numbers. We throw around words like fiduciary a lot, but it strikes me that folks that don't have a deep level of financial expertise wouldn't be able to push back against a bad investment advisor. Well, that, that may be true. And, and I guess what I would, I've often said this, um, in some of these meetings over the many years that I, you know, I, I think I said at this committee some time ago, um, I, I believe in index funds. I mean, so uh, there have been, you know, frankly, Warren, uh, Warren Buffett wagered a small bet to, for him, a, a, a unbelievable bet for me, I believe of a million dollars to five hedge fund, you know, active managers of funds. And it was a 10 year bet. Um, and the idea was he would put a million dollars into a, an index fund and they would actively manage their millions of dollars. And after 10 years, he outperformed them dramatically. And so um, I'm not sure that, you know, somebody questioning the investment advice, I mean, there are structural decisions that the, the VPIC board could make that would be a whole lot more healthy rather than selecting a particular investment vehicle that somebody might recommend. So I think there are ways to do it in a, in a thoughtful manner. And I think um, anybody with a reasonable education about investing, understanding the plan as they must, is equipped and well-equipped, frankly, to make those decisions. Rep Gannon. Thank you, Jeff, for, for testifying um, this morning, um, excuse me, this afternoon. And, and I really appreciate your written, your written testimony because it, you know, I wanna make sure we capture the details um, of your concerns, so I really appreciate that. Um, but I wanted to follow up, first of all, on Rep McCarthy's questions. Um, you, know, you cited the, the Boston College Center for Retirement Research, and one of the things they state in their research is extensive re research has related a higher proportion of board members with financial expertise to improved investment performance on pension funds. Um, so if we were to eliminate the, the two public members that you've suggested, where would that financial expertise come from? Well, I, I think that you could, I think the governor's appointee could, could have it. I think if, if we want to assume for a minute the treasurer's appointee would have it. I mean, there are other people that can bring that Bring that too. It also the Boston College report also talked about having a balance between plan participants and experts, and and so we can argue about whether which is more important. I, I think that leaning as it does currently on uh, non-plan participants, I say I would say is is out of balance with what I read in the Boston College report. So just to follow up on that, should we require that all members of VPIC have financial expertise? I don't think that's what uh, I don't think that's what the Boston College study talked about. No, it doesn't, I, but I'm just trying to get how we get some financial expertise um, on VPIC because you know, you know, Representative McCarthy said, well, you know, they make make poor investment decisions. Well, if you look at some of the past history of VPIC, one can definitely argue that there were some poor investment decisions. And well, I agree with you. Sim simpler investments like index funds. Are, are great um, for many people. Um, the pension right now invests in some very complicated investments. Private equities um, has invested in fund of hedge funds in the past. Um, th those are not your, your, your everyday investment that um, you or I 
uh, would invest in and, and require a sophisticated knowledge of investing to truly understand. So I'm just trying to figure out how we get an expertise on VPIC to push back when the investment advisor makes poor recommendations. Well, I think, you know, that's a delicate balance. I mean, I, I think that's the, right, it, it's, that's what the Boston College study I, I read, at least read into it, is the, the delicate dance between having experts, so-called experts, and planned participants who, uh, who have that sense of what, what's needed. So I, I think that, um, you know, frankly, that's a historical argument this country has had. You know, we've thought of in the past that the U.S. Senate would be the, the upper body and, and, and the, the hot house, if you will, and so we've had that dichotomy in this country for many years, and we're finding it out here. I think we're seeing it here play out as well. We want to have everyday average plan participants who are knowledgeable, who get up to speed, who have a baseline of understanding of the plan, as well as experts and not dominated one way or the other. And I think that's the challenge that, uh, I, you know, I think in fairness to the VPIC board, I think they need both voices uh, in the room, if you will. And... and Sticking with the, the, the Boston College um, Center for Retirement Research's paper on this, I mean, another point it makes is adequate stakeholder re representation, which it says includes plan participants, government officials, and general public members. So three groups. But we're eliminating some of those public members. Now, if you think there's a better way to appoint them than having the governor appoint them, I'm, I'm open to hearing that, but I do think there needs to be that balance between those three groups. Absolutely, and also it also talked about not having too many appointee, political appointees, and and uh, so I mean there there there's room for improvement. I'll I'll say that, and we can have that discussion and should. Um, I I think from our perspective, at least initially, and again, we want to engage with this conversation and and figure this out, uh, but certainly having plan participants, the voice of plan participants on this committee in a balanced, measured way is, is, a, is a necessary uh, first step for us. Okay, thank you very much. Rep LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Jeff. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna comment this just a little differently as you can probably imagine. Um, one, I guess I'd like to know a bit more about what you feel the plans participants perspective would bring to the investment side of this. And can you, I think, touch upon what would be the downside of totally professionalizing this? I think most would agree that we've gotten, we have the right people with the right skill sets in place recently. Um, with Mr. Galanka and a few others, and we've seen the benefits of that. But what would be the downside if you totally professionalized the investment side of this and you got the rate of return or that above that you were looking for? Well, I, uh, equally true, if you don't get that rate of return, then you're, gonna, you're not going to have buy-in. You're going to have you know, angry folks who don't have the rate of return that they want. So, I mean, I think that's part of the equation, I think Representative McCarthy was, you know, frankly, driving at that point, right? It's, it's buy-in from everybody. So I think that's part one. Part two is having planned participants voice on the, the investment group um, might help steer investments this way or that way that are consistent with the values of Vermonters, everyday working Vermonters. And so I think that's uh, another critical voice that uh, should be heard in these investment decisions. But with the structure that we've had in place, haven't we had that already? Uh, there, are, there are certainly planned participants. We're not proposing to change VPIC and that's the, the draft before you. Uh, and, and if we're gonna, you know, yes, they, there, there have been planned participants voice in there. And we think uh, th that voice needs to be there and remain so. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members? Rep Gannon. Uh, uh, thanks, Jeff, again. Um, two quick questions. Um, one, you know, Representative Hooper has repeatedly stated that OPEB should not be part of the discussion involving the task force. 
Um, and I, I just want to hear your opinion about that. Well, I, I mean, maybe we, uh, Representative Hoover and I might differ on that. I, certainly, OPEBs are in the in the process, and I mentioned it. You know, mostly the governor has talked about the four buckets. Uh, that is the reality, and and so we have talked about it mostly in the form of pensions, and and uh, but OPEBs are in the mix, and so I didn't want to shy away from it, and that's why I put it in there. So if we're going to talk about OPEBs, we ought to talk about how we, frankly, reform the system uh, as it relates to teachers, at least because. Uh, that's what I know. And, and uh, um, we think if there are savings to be had, uh, plowing them into the pension system is, a, is not a bad thing. Thanks. And, no, and I appreciate your written comments about some of the things we should look for with respect to health care benefits. Um, another question just about, I know you're worried about um, the aggressive timeline that the um, task force is under. Um, do you have any concerns about when it would start? Um, if we started it earlier than July 15th, would you have any concerns about that? Uh, yes. So I think the task force, I am worried that um, of COVID fatigue, I'll say it that way, honestly. I think, you know, when we all get vaccinated and I, I'm scheduled next week and I hope everybody here, you know, gets whatever is available to them ASAP. Uh, there's going to be a, a push and a desire and perhaps a need for all of us to get out and about and, and uh, see the landscape again. Um, and I, I worry about a July start when many people are going to be on break. So, I, I, you know, just frankly speaking and uh, realistically speaking, getting people to the table in July may be hard. So if you started earlier, uh, you, you know, some of the school employees are just finishing up a, a really hard year and state employees as well. I mean, they've had a, a frankly, a really tough year. Uh, and that's why I suggest stringing it out on the other end, maybe to October 15, to, to allow for a necessary uh, series of meetings, public as they may be, and analysis from some experts, if you, if, you know, that you've talked about, uh, to take a look under the hood and answer some of the questions that we think need to be answered, as well as what's in there now in the task force. The task force uh, is gonna really scratch the surface and, and really needs to be given the time to do so. Uh, the, you know, at the charge is pretty significant and I don't think we ought to shortchange it. Um, so if it needs to start earlier, I think people can do it. I hope they can do it. But also I would say, give them some more time at the other end when um, they might have a bit more energy, if you will. Thanks for that. And just one final question. Um, you know, the task force is supposed to, to seek out stakeholders. Um, are there any specific stakeholders uh, um, that we should be focused on in, in ensuring that we reach out to? Um, obviously, but I'm just, is there any specific group that you would want us to include? If I, if I may, Representative Gannon, uh, what you're suggesting is somebody not, or some group or otherwise not on the task force as it is now, or, or yeah, well, I assume we're going to take public testimony. I assume we'll hear from state employees and teachers. But I'm just thinking, is there any specific group of people um, or organization that we should definitely hear from, um, from your perspective? Well, I, you mentioned teachers and state employees, and I, I think you should and, and will hear from them, certainly. Um, and I hope that they're engaged, and I'm sure they will be. Um, so I, and their voice will be on the task force itself, and that's important. And again, it, it needs to be a balanced voice, I would say that. Um, I think, you know, people who might be affected by their decisions should be heard. I, you know, I don't, I, it's a great question. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a sizable list of people and, and yet I can't think of anybody specifically right now. Okay, I, I just, it was not a trick question or anything. I just wanted to make sure if there was some specific group that you thought we should reach out to that we will, and that we yeah. put that. You know, for example, I had a conversation recently with a business owner, uh, and they took, they weren't laying people off under the, in the past year. And so they took the federal stimulus monies, and instead of laying people off, they hired a bunch of people to expand their work. They, they saw this as a stimulus opportunity, and, and good for them for do, so doing. I mean, when the economy thrives, we all thrive. That's good. Um, but can they... You know, for example, pay a little bit more in taxes. They've, they've, they've expanded their business. That's good. 
And we typically think of uh, growth in that regard as, as potential revenue source for the state. Should we explore that? I think we should. You know, it's, it's the roads on which they travel, the, uh, the telephone lines, everything that, that the infrastructure of the state that helps business grow. Um, and I once heard Bill Gates Sr. talk about uh, the resources of the community that gave him the, the, the ability to achieve what he did and certainly what his son achieved. Uh, and it's, it's important that we give back. Uh, and I think that's what we're suggesting here now. I mean, the, the business community got some major tax cuts the last uh, few years under the Trump administration and uh, certainly looking at those and other revenue sources, new business models, for example, um, ought to be explored as well. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members? All right, thank you so much, Jeff. Please stick around uh, in case so. other conversation prompts more questions for you. Thank you. Uh, welcome to Amy Town, president of the State Employees Association. We appreciate you uh, being with us today and please share your thoughts with us. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Amy Town. I am the president of the Vermont State Employees Association. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the governance and task force proposals that you are currently considering. Let me begin with some of our concerns with the governance proposal as they relate to the Vermont Pension Investment Committee. Draft 1.1 would change VPIC's membership to 10 members, only three of whom would be members of the, the labor community. Six members would either be managers or their designees. This composition would mean that the people that the pension systems are designed to support would always be dramatically outnumbered by their bosses. We feel that it is crucial that the committee be at a minimum equally balanced between frontline workers and their bosses. As such, we suggest a committee makeup that would include two members and two alternates elected by the employee and retiree members of each of the three retirement boards for a total of six, <clears throat> excuse me, for a total of six retiree selected members. We would not change the number or composition of the other committee members proposed by the draft. This would yield a balanced board of 13. Currently the board is balanced, it's 331. If the legislature is truly dedicated to working hand in hand with employees and future beneficiaries to this plan, we need to safeguard the future of our funds. And it cannot begin by suggesting a new VPIC structure that would see our voices in danger of being drowned out before the work has even begun. The draft language would bar current legislators from serving on the committee. We oppose this provision. We believe that as long as Vermont has a citizen legislature, a member of VPIC who becomes a legislator or a legislator who is interested in serving on VPIC should not be excluded based on that basis. One provision in the draft language would bar people who are not Vermont residents from serving on VPIC. At the VSEA, we have members who live in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, and Canada. As telecommuting becomes more prevalent, even more Vermont State employees may live out of state. We do not believe that state employees, teachers, or municipal employees should be barred from participating simply because they live across a border. We support the, ban, um, the proposal ban on the acceptance of gifts from vendors to members of VPIC. We believe that the propriety of the state's investment choices must be beyond any reproach. VSEA supports the shift from a five-year to a three-year experience study. And currently VPIC and the retirement boards have come to a consensus on the actuarial assumptions before they are accepted. The draft language would end this collaborative process and place the power solely to VPIC. We oppose this proposed change and support maximizing the number of members who weigh in on these important decisions. Moving to sections of the bill that concern the new task force, we have some recommendations about the group structure. Um, we believe that the balance and inclusion is key. If you want to work, if you want the work of the task force to have credibility, 
and to yield a, resort, a result that can be supported by our members, then you have to have balance. In our proposal, or in the current proposal, excuse me, only four out of the 15 members are selected by labor unions, 11 out of 15 are non-labor, and most of those are managers. This would doom the task force to the perception that it is stacked unfairly against labor before the work has even begun. Also, one of the affected labor unions, the Vermont Troopers Association, has been omitted entirely from this draft plan. This is unacceptable. Instead, we, we suggest the following balance. Three members selected by the Vermont NEA, three members to be selected by the VSEA, three members selected by the Vermont Troopers Association, three legislative members from the House Committee on Government Operations, one from each Vermont major party, three legislative members from the Senate Committee on Government Operations, one from each Vermont major party, the director of the retirement division or his or her designee, the Commission of Department of Human Resources or his or her designee, a school board member chosen by the Committee on Committees, and finally, a chair elected by the members of this task force. You will note that we have removed two proposed committee members who were included in the draft proposal, the Commissioner of Department of Financial Regulation, as well as a member of the business community. Although we appreciate the committee's desire to include these members, we do not see essential, an essential nexus between these parties and the work of the task force. Furthermore, their participation would only add to the imbalance of labor and non-labor participants. Our proposal would yield a tripartisan balanced tax task force ready to represent the voices both of labor and other stakeholders. Our plan is equally structured with nine labor members and nine non-labor members in a mutually selected chair. Again, if this process is to have any success, we cannot allow our members or the general public to have the perception that the cake has already been baked. We need true balanced collaboration and input. We believe our plan accomplishes that. One additional note to point out, this bill should be clear um, that leave time for state employees and teachers serving on this task force shall not be withheld. With regard to the powers and duties of the task force, we support the additional two charges. First, the recommendation of a temporary dedicated revenue source or sources to raise no less than 100 million in new dedicated revenue it should be made clear that this charge shall include consideration and a recommendation on a temporary income surcharge on the wealthiest Vermonters. Second, an evaluation of and a recommendation on the creation of a so-called retirement group G to include frontline staff from the Vermont Veterans Home, Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence, and any other successor facilities, the Department of Corrections, both staff in our correctional facilities and those involved in community supervision, as well as our members at the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. The merit of giving these dedicated workers additional consideration in their retirement is contemplated by the current statutory group F carve out and Rep Representative Anthony's um, Bill H-305. We appreciate the desire for the board, um, continued stakeholder, stakeholder input, and we believe that it is vital that all of the members of the public have, an, have the opportunity to share their views. That's why VSCA supports a series of public hearings requiring pre-registration where speakers are given five minutes. The task force should be required to hold sufficient meetings in hearings to allow for all those who have registered in advance the opportunity um, to be heard. This task force should be open and transparent. As Justice Brandeis once said, sunshine is the best disinfectant. That's why this task force should be required to broadcast all of its meetings on YouTube and allow meetings to be viewed there retroactively. Finally, given the great part of the unfunded, unfunded liability can be attributed to the sins of the past, we strongly urge that the legislature invest that $150 million in either the prepayment of OPEB liability or directly into our pension funds. There is no good reason of which we are aware that that money should be just held in reserve. 
The only other difference of opinion that we have um, about those funds is that we think there should be more. <laughs> The past few months of this process have been incredibly difficult, and if this committee takes this serious, this this if this committee takes seriously the issues that VSEA has raised today, particularly concerning the 50-50 balance on fee pick and the task force, I truly believe that we have an opportunity here to work together and safeguard the future of our pension funds. And with that, I will stop and welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Any questions from committee members? Rep. Colston. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Amy, for your testimony. Um, assuming we would have a, a successful task force process, um, if you were to speak for your members, what are some goals and outcomes that you want to see accomplished through the task force? I think VSCA has been pretty clear with their position all along. Um, our priority is to have a strong pension system and to retain our benefit levels. Uh, our members have spoken loudly in support um, moving forward with the task force in order to accomplish those goals. Thank you. Brett Bihovsky. Thank you. This is a conversation. This is a question actually for both of you. And it's a conversation that's come up a couple of times in committee. And I just want to hear what your thoughts are. But the conversation around an independent facilitator to sort of navigate and help support these groups has come up a few times. And I'm curious if you have opinions or you think your members would have opinions on that. I, Amy, I, I could take it if you like. Uh, so we have some experience with it. Um, Representative Vahosky, we uh, at the statewide healthcare bargaining, we're using a facilitator to, to kick off the conversation right now. So uh, I, I, I actually think it'd be helpful. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, it would be helpful to get the parties to at least, you know, sort of baseline understandings um, as the task force begins its work so that, um, you know, we're not arguing about the setting of the table, right? We're arguing about what's in, what is on the table, what what what's important, not wh who's sitting where, and that kind of stuff. So I think it's it's a good suggestion. I can piggyback on that. I think our concern is um, that the split be 50-50 and certainly an independent facilitator to guide those conversations and have a very clear charge. So the work is is defined. I think would be helpful. Um, there is a goal right, to come out of this with the recommendations. So to have someone to help navigate that conversation, I think would be helpful. Thank you. Rep LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Amy. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm gonna probably ask you roughly the same questions that I asked Mr. Fannin and one is that, um, can you explain to me from your perspective what having your members perspective would bring to being on the VPIC board for one, two, what in your opinion would be the downside to having this investment side be totally professionally managed and by having your members continued having a presence on VPIC what, how could we expect a different outcome than where we are currently? I will do my best to answer. Um, thank you for the question, Representative LeClaire. So I first, I first just want to interject that the assumption that a member of this committee is less educated or less able to make um, decisions is, is a little bit insulting. Um, I think that there has been some incredible representation on both VPIC and VSERVs by members with extensive backgrounds. We had a member with a PhD in economics. We have certified fiduciaries who sit in labor seats. So to make the assumption that the sins of the past are caused by labor representation is quite insulting. Um, I believe that the split needs to continue the way that it is because we have skin in the game and to out to um, shift the balance 
takes away decision making from stakeholders. And I, I don't see that that could have um, a positive impact. I'm sorry if I didn't answer your question um, as articulate maybe as Jeff did, but that's kind of where I stand on that. So thank you. You did a very nice job. Thank you. Rep Gannon. So Amy, I just want to ask you a couple of questions about VPIC. I, I guess you reject uh, Boston College Center for Retirement's research on who should be the stakeholders um, on a pension board, which says that the stakeholders should be plan participants, government officials, and general public. I don't believe I said that I reject that. I just yep. said that I don't believe that the the I don't believe that the split should change. Our position is that the split remained 50 50, 331, or and our proposal is 661. That's not what BC says. So you reject that. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm not going to back myself into a corner and say that I personally reject a study. I'm representing the views of my members. And if you would like, I could go back to my members and ask them broadly do you reject this study? I'd be more than happy to do that. Our members are asking that this body consider any changes made to reflect that it is still important for our stakeholders to have an equal opportunity at the table to make decisions in a plan that we support. And so if you're asking me personally, if I reject the study, I would have to think about it and get back to you. But if you're asking me if my 6,000 membership rejects the study, again, I would have to get back to you. Thank you for that. So do you think there should be a requirement for financial expertise on the VPIC board? I think that financial expertise is part of the equation that lends itself to a successful board. I think that there's more to it, right? I think the members of the VPEC are appointed by members of the retirement boards to serve in a capacity, uh, making difficult decisions. They are chosen by their peers based on a lot of different reasons, their skill set in particularly. Um, I, I do not see... I do not see any malfeasance for many members of the VPIC. I think they take their role seriously and spend a number, an, an exhausting number of time becoming uh, certified fiduciaries and increasing their education so that they are able to have those conversations and make it, those decisions. So I'm not sure what you're asking me. Well, I was just saying, I'm going back to the Center for Retirement Research's um, research, which indicates that extensive research has related a higher proportion of board members with financial expertise to improve investment performance of pension funds. Right. And I'm saying that those members that are elected or appointed to the VPIC are represented, are, are appointed by members of the retirement boards because of their experience. I don't believe that having a degree in finance makes you any more wise to financial decisions than anyone else. I, I think that people are appointed to that committee based on their experience and desire to serve. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members? Uh, Rep Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a general question. How many members on VPIC are currently certified fiduciaries? I don't know. I'll just say that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't know the number offhand, but I can speak to our um, our representative, um, Jeff, Jeff Briggs, is a certified um, fiduciary. Rep. Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Jeff and, and uh, uh, Amy. Uh, I want to go back to a, uh, a bit of advice that the committee got uh, last week, uh, I believe it was last week, from uh, one of the consultants who have been helping the treasurer and uh, the current VPEC board uh, work their way through a number of these issues. And two of the areas that were stressed in my, to my ears, 
were in, in either task, for, task force context or uh, a uh, rejuvenated VPIC were um, independents in the sense of not being uh, directly uh, tied to um, uh, some kind of electoral um, context and continuity. Let me start with continuity. Uh, I, I think, I believe it was Jeff talked about um, having the chair uh, serve longer uh, than some of the members. Uh, what, what in either of your views does continuity mean to you in the sense that we, we definitely want, and I respect the uh, comment, I think it was Jeff, who talked about removal and, and, and there was a removal clause in some of the earlier versions we looked at. But if, if each of you would give me some sense as to what continuity means in terms of the um, renewal cycle, um, history with an organization, history with the issues, uh, let me stop there. I, I do want to ask about political uh, affiliation and interference too, but let me focus on continuity first and, and see what your perspectives are. Obviously, the, the closer you can focus, the faster we'll get through this. So thank you. So I will just jump in real quick and say that this proposal or bill came out on Wednesday. Our board has not met to take a, an official position on any of this. So as, as far as speaking to continuity and things that we'd like to see moving forward, that's a bigger conversation that's a, that I could offer here today. So I can take that back and certainly um, report back to you on, on the feedback that I receive. And Jeff. if I may, Representative Anthony, I think, I think what you're asking, maybe if, if I'm understanding correctly, but I think there is 12-year um, terms on the proposed VPIC and that terms that are staggered. So you talk about continuity. And I think if, if you stagger the start and or the, you know, on and off, that does provide enough continuity uh, between knowledge of the plan, knowledge of investment uh, resources. And, and just for the record, they just do more than, they do some more than just investment, uh, strictly speaking. Uh, but I think that does provide enough continuity and fresh voice to come on and off the board, if you will. Okay, thanks. And um, the, <clears throat> the involvement in electoral politics <clears throat> cuts several different ways, obviously. The treasurer is elected. Uh, I consider a surrogate or appointee of the executive branch to be equivalent of elected, quite frankly. I'm elected. A and yet, uh, you know, there's an issue, I think, with wanting uh, legislators or uh, someone from that world to be present. And yet I, I, I sense that there's a reluctance to accept uh, uh, finance and management or uh, Department of Financial Regulation as a sort of surrogate for uh, gover governors, uh, appointees. And yet all of us uh, obviously have uh, perspectives, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not hired and fired by a single individual, but I am hired and fired by a community. I don't know if that makes a difference, uh, but give me your cut on political appointees because that changes the complexion, never mind the issue of balance, which I respect, but that changes the complexion uh, uh, greatly if we, if we really get hard, hard, uh, hard, uh, uh, hardly respectful of definitions in that regard. I think I'll try to take a stab at this. So uh, there's two two things going on here. You've got the VPIC board, obviously, um, and political appointees. And that's sort of what Representative Gannon and I have been chatting about the Boston College. Amy, in fairness to Amy, I was the one who raised it. And, and uh, uh, <laughs> she may not have had a chance to read it yet. Um, it's a good, it's a page turner. Um, <laughs> but uh, on footnote 13, I think it is, if, if I'm right on that, Representative Gannon, correct me, please. Uh, it talked about uh, not having too many elected officials on VPIC on, on the investment side of the equation. Where I was talking about it, Representative Anthony, is on the task force um, and about the, the commissioner of, um, uh, of DFR, Department of Financial Regulation. So that's where I was talking about that. So I, you know, they, it is confusing a little bit, VPIC and the task force, but the task force, um, I think, as Amy eloquently said, is, is the place where we really you know, really are pounding on the need for uh, balance 
because that's going to look under the hood, look at where we, we have been and where we're going to go in a thoughtful, methodical way, hopefully. Uh, and I think it's really important there that we have balance. I mean, it's important on VPIC too. I'm not, I don't mean to diminish that, but uh, certainly on the task force, the balance is necessary. And uh, you've got to have enough planned participant voice to get, as Amy said, you know, buy-in and credibility from those who are affected by the proposed changes. Right. Rep I don't know if Amy has any thoughts oh. on the, okay. Let me just point out the obvious, <clears throat> the reason I'm a little worried about VPIC is part of the, um, how shall I say, wake-up call came from the reasonably drastic and recent uh, re-evaluation of the assumption of rates of return. And one could say, so how come it took so long? And you could argue that there are interests in um, elected, amongst elected circles who are not really looking for bad news. Uh, and so I, 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 I respect your emphasis on the um, uh, task force, but unfortunately, I'm afraid uh, VPIC's history argues that there, there are some tendencies uh, to uh, shy away from bad news. Uh, and politicians are pretty good at that. And I say that being a politician myself. Thank you. Rep Dijovsky. Thank you. My understanding is that the current VPIC board already skews towards so-called experts. I, I believe there's three members of labor and four various members of experts, however we define that, and that it's a little bit of a false impl implication to question whether it was the employees group's representation that caused this problem and that they're somehow responsible for the current state of the funds. I think this outcome is actually the product of several factors, one of which is the decisions that have been made over years by investors and by the legislature. So I, th I think that's just a statement more than a question. Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a question for Amy. Uh, Amy, thanks for being here today. Um, I guess uh, maybe you're aware that I've been um, uh, hoping for and looking for uh, a possible hybrid option. Um, so I guess I, I'd just like to ask, um, it is happening across the country in, in some regards. Um, I know that, uh, uh, you know, some of your members from the Vermont State Colleges, they have a uh, contribution plan. It's not the benefit plan. I believe that Beamers uh, has an option for that as well. Um, one of the things that I see, uh, as long as it's a good competitive uh, program, um, it is an option. Uh, there's no vested issues. It's portable. Uh, folks can invest the way they want if they have some real issues around uh, what, uh, what the treasurer or, or the VPIC board is looking at investing in. So I guess, you know, again, uh, the, the other concern I have is even in talking with options with JFO, they talk about how we could maintain what we have, but make changes around the edges. And I'm just wondering if that's, I know that you've spoken and I've heard loud and clear from your members that they wanna keep things as is, but that changes of the roundy edges concerns me. So I guess in that there's, there's a couple of questions there, but uh, um, any, any uh, input into, into any of that? Sure. Thank you for the question, Representative Higley. I haven't seen you at all this week. I was, for a while there, I was seeing you almost every day. Um, I know. <laughs> so I think it's, it's safe to say that the BSCA supports maintaining a defined benefit program. We don't have any interest in, this, in any interest in switching to a hybrid or defined contribution system. And I recognize that the co colleges does have a defined contribution system. We would love to welcome them to define benefit, by the way. Um, so I understand that there is certainly um, the desire from some to learn more about the defined contribution. BSCA does not support that. We absolutely stand by defined benefit and maintaining the dignity in retirement that the defined benefit system um, offers our members. 
So again, though, have uh, actual Vermont State College members reached out and been disappointed in their their plan, their current pension plan? We have had state employees. Um, we have had members from the state colleges voice that they wish that they had defined benefits. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well. Thank you. And I think, you know, from our end of things, I think it's important, like I said, to be able to go, uh, you know, to this with a sustainable, uh, good plan going forward that, that is attractive to uh, uh, employees out there. And um, I just I just hope that there's uh, something that can be worked out where we're not going to be fiddling every five or 10 years with this uh, defined benefit plan. On that, we agree. Thank Thanks. you. So committee, any other questions for Amy or Jeff? All right. Um, so I, Amy and Jeff, I, I hope you'll stick around. I think you'll find the next hour of committee to be uh, just as interesting as the last hour was. Um, Thank you. And uh, at this point, we will shift gears because I understand that, um, oh, Representative Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, I'm still struggling with reception today. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Um, I had just a quick question for whoever would like to answer it. Um, so while there might be an opposition to a hybrid plan, is that still being talked about for those who would like to learn about it? Um, because while um, people have heard that some, you know, people had wished they had a DB plan, we have also heard during testimony quite frequently that people wish they had opportunity to a DC plan. Um, so I'm hoping while some people may have reservations to a hybrid plan, that that's still something out in the open. And I know there have been proposals to a plans that do exactly what everyone's asking and they leave people's current benefits alone. Um, and there are other options um, and options for everybody where, and if you aren't comfortable, you know, with, you know, with a DC plan, then you can go into an annuity. And, and my ask is, is, even though there might be some reservations to something, is it still being spoken about um, and not just dragged off the table? I can jump in. So um, our members are currently um, discussing pensions pretty heavily. Uh, and while we are incredibly supportive of maintaining a defined benefit plan, there absolutely have been rumblings about um, what it would look like if we had a DC plan. We have members who independently invest in their 457 plans who have seen enormous returns over the last year and question the investments made in our defined benefit. But as we have those discussions with our members and we, ex we explain to them the benefits versus the, um, the pros versus the cons, the DB versus a DC plan, the consensus has been continuing to have the DB plan. The state of Vermont offers a 457 plan for those who elect to be in it. So in essence, many of us have a hybrid plan. We have the stability of a DB, and then we have the ability to invest and watch those investments in the 457. We as VSCA have absolutely not changed our position. We hold firmly to the stance of maintaining our DB system today and, and moving forward for future state employees. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, may I ask another question? Absolutely. Um, would we be able to receive a copy of the explained um, pros and cons that you are explaining to your members? And the other question is, I guess for both of you, do you both feel right now you currently have a true defined benefit plan? Because in my uh, thinking of how people enjoy a defined benefit plan is that you have a low risk, you know, low to no risk. Um, and to me, you guys are picking up the risk again. Um, and again, you're coming back to the table to fight for something that is supposed to be defined um, with low to no risk to you. So um, that, as in both of you, I would ask that question too. Do you truly believe right now you have what you are asking for? I can answer, uh, I'll jump in first. I saw Jeff reaching for the mute button, but I was already unmuted. Um, I will speak from a personal 
um, point of view. So removing my hat as president of ESCA, I am a 21 year state employee. I started with the state because I had a family and I knew that I wasn't going to get rich working for the state, but I was working for the state, making an investment in my family through the benefits that were offered with state employment, great health care and a pension. The pension was important to me. I knew when I started that I would need to work 30 years, which gave me enough time to raise my family buy a house, pay that house down and be prepared in 30 years to then move on to my second life, right? So every year I received a, a, this green folded thing in the mail that showed if I retire here, this is what my benefit is gonna be. That's defined benefit. I have known all along through my years of service when I retire, what my annual benefit would be. Defined benefit. For the rest of my life, this is what I'm gonna receive. Defined contribution. This is what I'm gonna receive point in time for the rest of my life, unless things change, there is no, it or until the money runs out, right? So there's not the same level of security provided in a defined contribution as there is in a defined benefit. So the, and then I just wanna circle back to the list of pros and cons. There's not a formal list of pros and cons. When we explain to people what the defined benefit system is versus what the defined contribution is, they start thinking about their personal life. When I retire, is it more important to me to know that I'm retiring at 65 and this is what my annual benefit plus cost of living is going to be and I, I could live comfortably until I die at 90? Or is it or is it scary to think this is how much I have and I, I have to die before I turn 80 because I'm going to run out of money? There's stability in one plan and not the same amount of stability in the other. And then you did ask, if I'm comfortable in my defined benefit plan, no, I'm not. As of November, after Thanksgiving, when the discussions around the plan came up, I started getting scared because I'm not sure that I have the same level of stability in my defined benefit plan that I did a year ago. I might have to work 17 years longer than I had planned on. I might have um, you know, less of a benefit because there's going to be changes potentially to the AFC. So I'm not sure if I answered your questions in order, but I certainly attempted. That, that's okay. The, 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 to me, I don't feel that you currently have what people dream or have as a defined benefit plan. Because if you would have opened the green, you know, and I think that's what you were saying, if you would have opened that green folded envelope up um, last year, you know, that's what you were set at. And now we've came at, you know, uh, not we, but there has been proposals put on the table that want to change that and take that away from you. That's not defined in any way. That is uncertainty of it's as good as it is until something changes and there's another mishap. Um, and that's just the point that I've, I've been trying to say is right now we're not um, as, as solid and promised as, you know, a defined benefit plan should be. So thank you very much for your, your comment. Thank you. If I, if I may, uh, Madam Chair, um, Representative Lefebvre, I think that the, the more fundamental question you may be driving at is uh, about whether there can be any changes to a defined benefit plan. And, and uh, I think that's, you know, if, correct me if I'm wrong about that, but we, we have, I do believe we have a defined benefit. And I'll just say that firmly. Uh, but it, it's not to say that there aren't changes along the way. And so, for example, and as I mentioned in my testimony in 2010, in 2014, we made adjustments to the plan in a collaborative fashion, and and uh, to shore, you know, to what we thought, particularly in 2010, was we were shoring up the plan. We reamortized the uh, the the system for 30 years, so we're a third of the way through that plan to pay down the unfunded liabilities. Um, we've got two two thirds more to go, um, but certainly a defined benefit can change, and and it has uh, over my tenure and. Um, you know, that's what we're discussing here. It does not mean that we don't, though, have a defined benefit plan. We certainly do. Yes, th thank you for that. I, you know, to me, hearing, you know, sitting through and reading through the hours and hours of testimony, I've heard people say they were forced into something and now it's yet again changing. If there was going to be so much uncertainty, you know, they would have gone with the DC plan to start with. And my only fear is that, you know, I, my only ask and appreciation would be to have it be on the table and to talk about it and to not because and to not have it completely removed or just thought of as something bad. That was that was my only ask um, moving forward. And I appreciate both of your um, time testimony testifying today. Thank you. Can I ask Amy? 
Sorry. Yeah. So I just want to be clear that my uncomfort in the DB system is not the system. I, I believe in the system. I believe that the benefits are there. There's over $5 billion in assets. I don't think there's going to be an issue of insolvency. That's not where my discomfort is. My discomfort, and I think I'm speaking for members broadly, my discomfort is the discussion that we're having here. My discussion is, or my uncomfort is the, the proposals being moved forward to potentially cut the benefit, to potentially add the years, not in the system itself. The uncomfort lies in this discussion. So I just wanted to be clear with that. Any other questions from committee members for either Jeff or Amy? Okay, um, so we have two folks who've just joined us and uh, and it is my hope that um, that we can can uh, hear from um, folks on the point of the reorganization of the governance um, of our pension system uh, from from the VPIC uh, changes that are proposed in the bill. Um, and then we'll talk separately and secondly about the um, about the makeup of the task force, which is the other major part of the bill. Um, so I understand Tom Galanka and Beth Pierce, you, um, you were both just in a meeting with the VPIC and that you have a document that is up on our committee page. And I'm not sure if you already flipped a coin to tell us who was going to report out on, uh, on this document, but, um, oh. I will, I will defer to Tom uh, as chair of the VPIC and, uh, and we just finished a meeting. Um, uh, and uh, so if Tom is willing to do that and I can make any further comments on that. And I presume we'll also have time to talk about the task force today. And um, I think that that's not something that VPIC is um, um, uh, testifying on, but certainly in, in my role. So it might be better if, um, if Tom went first and I can, um, continue on the discussion after that. Uh, Tom, you um, may not agree with that, but I just volunteered you. <laughs> oh, that's, that's good. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I appreciate the opportunity to talk again today. I know we've been going back and forth in regards to governance. Um, what we've, you should have on up on your website or, or the file document from a document from VPIC. And this was approved unanimously from the VPIC members today. Um, we've only had, we only had a chance to talk some of the ideas because we only had an hour today before this meeting came on. So we do commit to review as, as soon as possible other items that we didn't have unanimous consent on uh, at this point. Um, but I do want to uh, briefly, and those items that we'll talk about in the future will be ideas of term limits and ideas of legislators on the committee. Uh, we've deferred those two issues for future discussion. But in general, VPIC is very pleased with the progress that's been made on this document from the original document. And uh, I've had a, a, a numerous uh, discussions with uh, members, board members uh, of both VPIC as well as the, the chairs of all of the underlying pension boards over the past couple of days. So I think I have a general feel for how the boards feel about this as well as VPIC feels about um, different items on this uh, topic. You will notice that we've listed five different items where we think the current bill that's been proposed um, could stand some tweaking uh, you know, from, from minor changes. The first item is on um, how it's defined, uh, how VPIC is defined uh, as a, in the attached to the office of the state treasurer. Uh, Beth and I agree that that needs to be changed and, and VPIC agreed to that. We've offered some uh, language that we think would, would make sense in that area to make it simple, simpler and also to continue the process on um, uh, making VPIC more of an independent structure that works in concert with the treasurer's office. The second um, idea that we talked about was the idea of shall a VPIC member be a state resident? And we unanimously agreed that you should strike that. Um, we felt it would, uh, from your prior conversations at the House GovOps committee meetings that we, we could be limiting, um, and we didn't, we could be limiting uh, financial experts that we wouldn't want to limit. So leaving that open for the underlying pension boards to decide who they want to appoint, we thought would uh, be best left in their hands. So we suggest striking that. Uh, a legal, uh, position on number three, uh, we we noticed that it, there became an issue of voting with the structure that you would in, put in place that would uh, 
make it every vote would have to be a super majority, it seemed, if we only had six members. And we felt that could be potentially cumbersome if we had to rapidly move on, say, an investment manager or some type of contracting decision. We didn't disagree that that could be the intent of this committee for, say, the rate of return assumptions or some of the more uh, significant decisions that BPIC would make, but we uh, strongly recommended that you reconsider um, that. And I think we listed the section 522 F3. Um, the one section in four where it responds to 90 days, and that was a recommendation that came from our consultants. Um, they said they can do it in 90 days, but we, if we do it in 90 days, you may be missing current actual values from June 30th. And so he recommended extending that a little bit more, maybe 120 or 180. We listed 180 because we figured that would, that would coincide with the dates of the reports that you've requested in other sections. It also would meet the requirement that you'd have this report be, before the beginning of the legislative season. But we, we don't get actual values on private equity and private debt um, until about 90 days. So we figured that that constraint may make values a little bit different. And the last item is number five. We had a long discussion today about the definition of independent, and we thought it was a little confusing. So we just wanted thought it'd be uh, some clarification on that, specifically whether particip partici participation in the plan would be material under this definition to exclude people from being on VPIC. So we just wanted some clarification on that. But overall, we felt it was, uh, um, we've made some tremendous progress over the past couple of weeks. And I think we're, we have further work to do with, uh, in regards to um, uh, term limits and legislative uh, membership. But uh, I think these are five steps that I think would make it uh, uh, more palatable for VPIC. And we unanimously approved this recommendation. So with that, I don't know, Beth, if you wanted to explain more about the independent language in one, because um, I knew you, you helped craft that. Well, certainly, and thank you very much. And I do think we've made some progress. I did present um, the piece that Tom and I sent to the board. I, I think it was a week ago. This is moving kind of fast so that uh, time kind of um, compresses in some areas. But it um, uh, went over that with the teacher board yesterday. And uh, uh, they had a lot of questions. There was a lot of uh, interest in this, but uh, they wanted to wait themselves until uh, VPIC took a position on that. And now that VPIC has, we'll go back and talk to the Vistas board as well as the others. We're meeting uh, next week with the state board as well. I'm not sure off the top of my head what date that is, but um, uh, and we'll, certainly we'll certainly include that on the agenda as well. Um, the big piece for me is, is moving uh, VPIC to an independent um, uh, entity. And to do that, I think there are a couple of things. Number one, um, VPIC needs to have its own budget um, and be separated out from the Treasurer's Office budget um, in appropriations. We'll be happy to work with that uh, so that um, uh, the uh, uh, there's a salary right now for um, uh, not much uh, for all the work he does. Tom, you never thought you'd be doing all the work you've come in and done over the years when when we uh, when we asked you to do this this project. But um, uh, and I think that uh, the statute itself says one third of the of the salary uh, equivalent of one third of the salary of the treasurer. I think the VPIC. Um, as a separate entity should be allowed uh, some flexibility there uh, to set the salary of the of the chair and the CIO um, and that the CIO um, um, uh, would be in a position um, now and in the future to um, um, to hire staff and to and to set compensation so separate that out from the treasurer's office create their own budget um, and then we would work uh, with them now um, in in other states that have these, uh, they have uh, memorandums of agreement between the treasurer's office and um, and uh, uh, Prim, for instance, in Massachusetts. I, I managed to find a copy of their um, uh, their operational trust agreement, uh, which goes back many years and updated as of 1998, and they haven't had updated apparently since then. But um, um, we would certainly have some type of relationship. There would be some reimbursements, for instance, if we provide services. Um, to VPIC, um, uh, they would they would um, um, reimburse um, our, our budget line item. Um, over time, they may hire more of their own staff to do these things. For instance, right now, they would probably use our office to do electronic transfers and direct our staff to do that. Um, uh, we would still be preparing the financial statements at this point in time. Um, at some point, um, both um, 
um, SWIB, which is the, uh, the State of Wisconsin Investment Board, and PRIM produce their own uh, uh, annual financial reports. Uh, perhaps um, um, uh, they would want to move in that direction uh, down the road. Uh, and so we would have to work out some of those things in a transition. But I think step number one, and it's a very visible step, is that it has its own budget its own staffing plan and it presents its own budget to, uh, to, to appropriations and through that process. So I think that that's very important. And I would um, agree that, um, uh, well, uh, uh, and I do think that uh, they should have some flexibility on the salary of the, um, of the, uh, of the chair. Um, I would agree with Tom about the six out of nine members, um, voting members, because there's uh, 10 members, but uh, six, um, uh, nine voting members. And I think that that could be cumbersome uh, beyond that, you know, the pieces on the standards of con co uh, conduct, the um, uh, conflicts of interest and the job duties, uh, we already have um, pieces for that, but I think it's a great idea to put them in here um, so that they continue to have them, that it's about checks and balances. And I've thought about this a, a, a great deal. I think we've got a great chair. Um, I think we've got uh, a great team. Um, um, but you don't know what the future is going to look like um, um, and that we want to have those checks and balances in place uh, for the future. Uh, uh, I look at our committee now, and I and uh, I was looking at our, our the qualifications. Right now, we have uh, Tom as well as another individual that are registered investment advisors. Uh, that second individual is is um, uh, appointed by the uh, by the by the governor, and there's no guarantee that uh, uh, the governor in the future, uh, she or he, I did that on purpose, um, um, would um, um, be uh, appointed an expert under the certain the other piece. The other gubernatorial appointment has uh, 15, 20 years as a, um, uh, a president and CEO of a major company, um, as well as a legal background. I would um, consider her an expert, well done, but I don't know what, um, what the governor would do uh, necessarily in that case. One of the board members uh, that we have, um, uh, um, uh, that is an employee member. Uh, he has an a, a undergraduate degree in math, an um, MBA with a concentration in finance and teaches courses on finance and, um, uh, finance and, um, and um, the mathematics of finance um, uh, in colleges. Um, now, I think he, and he's also been on this thing for forever, but that doesn't mean that the next board is going to pick, uh, I, I, just the nice things about the guy. So I say that doesn't mean the next board is going to pick Joe Mackey. Okay. Um, I think that um, uh, we want to have that checks and balances in the system uh, moving forward. So I think that there's a great deal of good expertise, but we want to make sure that there is in the future, no matter who's treasurer, no matter who's governor, uh, and no matter who's um, um, in, in the general assembly as well. So I think that this is very good. Um, I would agree that we need to have a more conversation about uh, uh, the, um, the term limits. Um, I, I don't think Tom is ever going to complain that we got a 20 year limit on his, but I was thinking about one board that I'm on. Uh, 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 David Coates and I have been on the um, Capital Debt Affordability Committee since for a long time. David's been on there since he was a founding member in 1991. And uh, I hope as long as I'm treasurer, he's still there. Okay, we're not going to agree on pensions, just for the record. He and I have uh, some differing views about defined benefit and defined contribution. Be happy to have that uh, debate anytime um, with uh, folks. We've done it four times, including in front of the legislature uh, on a couple of occasions. Um, but uh, the, re the, uh, the reality is that I think some consistency and, and tenure is, is good as people are learning things. But I recognize that, that that's an issue as well. So we're in, we're, I think we're generally in agreement. I think that the checks and balances are good. Um, and, uh, uh, and I compliment the members of the committee um, that um, have put the time and effort into this as well. So uh, step in the right direction. I hope I wasn't on mute that whole time. No, goodness, no. We would have flagged you down by now. Um, <laughs> okay. Thank you both so much for your work on this um, and for your thoughtful recommendations here. Um, I very much appreciate it. Um, Rep. Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Treasurer and Madam Chair and Tom. Uh, it came up earlier in today's conversation and has come up in the past um, to have some mechanism independently of the term limits or the uh, uh, reappointment cycle or who the appointing officer or organization is to have some sort of removal uh, escape language. That is to say, if it turns out that someone is not participating or for whatever reason, I, I can imagine there being just cause language in there too, but I, I wonder if uh, 
as the as the numbers expand, uh, there might be some reason to have a removal section in there of a board member that uh, has not proved out in some sense or another. Well, I'd like your opinion on that. Thanks. If it's okay, Tom, I'd like to take the first uh, crack at that. Um, sure. Right now, um, you know, the much aligned uh, um, aligned in this process was, well, we have a report on attendance and, and education and we send that out. That's so that the boards, uh, the three trustee boards knew the members were in fact attending and they were in fact taking the types of requisite um, uh, 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 coursework to uh, uh, in investments. And in fact, I believe when I read the, um, uh, the current bill that that is still included. So there was a reason for that. In addition, if you look at our ethics policy um, and conflict of interest policy, it does have um, uh, um, uh, consequences for violating those um, in there, um, whether you're, you're prohibited from voting. I think that um, um, uh, there are, um, uh, we've talked about trying to tighten those up a little bit more as we move forward. And I think that that would be part of the policy, but uh, we do have a clear ethics policy. You can't, for instance, be um, talking to vendors outside of a, of a procurement process. You can't have them dine, you know, take you out for dinner. Um, you can't take gifts. Um, if you go to a conference, it has to be one that uh, VPIC approves of. It's not one that's essentially a marketing thing where they want to um, uh, 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 treat you to a meal and get you to talk to them about their investments. We also have um, um, a limitation on what's called placement agents. Um, and uh, I'm sure John is shaking his head on that one uh, where people become an intermediary um, between um, and usually um, um, old politicians, uh, older politicians in there and uh, after they've left service, let me rephrase that one. Um, and, uh, and trying to be an intermediary to, um, on a paid basis between uh, pension boards and, uh, uh, and uh, investment managers. So we, we do a lot to try to exclude all that. We do have in our ethics statements um, um, consequences to, uh, to violation of those. I think we can certainly look at those as well. Part of the statute requires that we, we, we provide uh, 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 for those uh, ethics and conflict of interest uh, policies. And uh, we can certainly take another look at it, but I think there's recourse there. And I think that that's where the recourse should be. If you do it wrong, there's a consequence to it. And, um, uh, and I think that um, um, that's where it belongs. Beth, I would add too in that, we had a conversation at our, uh, back in November or December when we had our fiduciary session where we bought in that, um, the group from Aon who talked about what, what's our fiduciary responsibility. And the problem with having sort of uh, ability to remove members, it brings in po politics into potentially removing members for not doing what you want or certain members. Uh, and so people wear fiduciary hats when they come into a board such as ours. And, and I think, who do you give the right of removal to and how do you exercise that, I think would be a dangerous thing to go down. Um, I think there are reasons for removal that are obvious, whether it's a criminal behavior or whether it's uh, non-attendance. Um, then it gets a little sort of a gray area. Is it because you didn't vote for divestment or is it because you didn't do X, Y, Z? I, I think it, it's dangerous to, to have that in the hands of whoever, whether it's the appointing body, whether it's the governor, whether it's a VPIC itself. So I, I'd be careful on language like that other than strict reasons of ethics or violations of policy, because if it's strictly because of their opinion, I think you run the risk of having um, unintended consequences. So I, I'd be careful on, on that type of language. I, the only reason I mention it, or one of the reasons, is you have confirmed what um, many of us have, have divined from many of the, the comments, namely, if this board uh, moves out of the treasurer's office and becomes uh, sort of somewhat insular or at least independent, uh, that raises a question of, of how you would manage essentially internal integrity and whatnot. And I, I respect your worry about being overly broad about the grounds for removal, but I just think independence begets a certain inter internal self-discipline about that issue. Thanks. If, if I could add one more comment to that, uh, there, there are certain SEC requirements in terms of investment managers, for instance, um, in the pay to play field, for instance, um, that have um, um, uh, been uh, improved over the years. And uh, so I think that from the investment manager side too, uh, there's more, uh, 
if they approach you in an inappropriate way or try, you know, try to add to your political campaign or do all these things, um, there's recourse. And um, and so I think that the regulatory environments addressing that, the ethics policies and the practices, I think, do. Uh, I would be careful that you create that political um, uh, uh, pressure. You know, um, I, I'll go back to the divestment issue as well. You know what I mean? It. Um, um, uh, I wouldn't have wanted to see a member removed because, um, or, or uh, either by a gubernatorial appointee or by um, by a board because they um, they had a different vote uh, putting their fiduciary hat on. Um, um, and I think that people do a good job of of understanding that. And we do have fiduciary training, by the way, as part of our uh, of our coursework. So. All right, other questions from committee members with respect to the memo on the makeup of VPEC. All right. Um, so we should shift gears then and, um, and wanted to give Treasurer Pierce the opportunity to, uh, to share any comments or reflections on the makeup of the task force, uh, the timeline of the task force, the duties of the task force, um, uh, any, any uh, advice or, or recommendations you can give to us on that. Well, certainly very uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this. You know, I, um, I was here in the 2009-2010 study um, as a deputy treasurer, not as a treasurer. And uh, I noticed that a lot of the language seems to came from the, uh, from the 2009, uh, Act 1 of the special session had a piece on this. And uh, 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 it was E something, E one third, ah, never mind. Um, um, but uh, the, the um, so it follows that in many, many respects. One area it doesn't is the size of the, uh, well, it does two things. Number one, it does have representation from the, uh, from the employee groups which the prior uh, um, 2009, 10, 2010 study did not. And that was a mistake back in 2010. Um, you definitely need to have stakeholders at the table. Um, so I wanna compliment you on doing that. I think that was a, a very, very bad mistake. And uh, partway through the process, that was uh, apparent to many. Um, that group was a group of seven. Uh, this, as I counted up last night, was 15. I understand that, um, um, that uh, uh, that there will likely be more representation from the uh, Vermont Troopers Association that was not included. So we're probably talking 15, 16, 17 people. That's a large committee. So I would just point that out uh, in terms of the size and getting something done. Um, it, it's hard to do that. And if you're looking at a period from July 15th to, um, to uh, September 1st, um, uh, that, that's a heavy lift. Uh, with a with a large body like that, getting up to speed and, and getting things done. So, that would be um, a, a comment in general as I as I look at committees that I've been involved in. You know, VPIC started off as a committee of seventeen, or the committee of the whole, because they couldn't decide who should be on and who should be off. And in two thousand and seven, eight, we did that study that got it down to its current seven. And now we're going to move to ten. Uh, it looks that way, anyways. But I think it's a manageable number. Um, I um, so I would caution about that. Um, as far as the, um, the, 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 the committee itself, and I've been putting some thought into this, um, and um, I think there are a couple of practical issues, and then there's one to me that's really about a, um, a philosophical or principle, uh, issue of uh, uh, underlying principles. As a practical matter, uh, I'm concerned about um, our, our involvement in the plan, um, specifically the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, director of retirement. Um, as you heard in testimony and you heard my praise many, many times over, we did 500 or 495, I won't exaggerate, 495 retirements in the month of July last year. Um, and um, uh, those start up and big, you know, people determine in the month of June, um, uh, possibly earlier, uh, that they're, they're ready to retire. Um, and uh, that is an incredible amount of work that has to get done. Uh, last year was done remotely. Um, it uh, with people coming in, getting what they need, going uh, going through um, uh, uh, Teams or uh, Zoom or phone calls and working with folks. Um, it's very difficult in any normal year. Uh, with COVID, it's been even more difficult. Um, so um, I had some concern about the ability of the retirement division to staff this. In addition to that, I'm thinking back to 2009 and 10 again. A member of the retiree staff. 
um, took the notes and did the follow-up pieces and, 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 and that type of work as well. And they don't have the, the bandwidth to do this. In addition to that, as I'm thinking about the timing, um, uh, uh, once the retirements are done, we also go through a process where we're, we're uh, with our IT people and our retirement people and the actuaries of, of literally going person to person, taking a look and make sure the data is right before we move on to the, uh, to the actuarial process. And we're also doing the financial statements um, between um, in August and in, uh, to September 15th. So uh, it's not a good time period. So that was the practical side of it. Um, the, the philosophical side of it to me is that, um, is that um, this is an independent task force. And as I'm thinking this through in, 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 in the process here, that, uh, that uh, we, um, uh, we very strongly feel that, um, uh, that you know, we submitted a report, the Treasurer's Office submitted a report and a series of recommendations. You have those. Uh, we've continued to uh, provide information and we will continue to do that. But, uh, uh, but uh, the, the fact of the matter is that the General Assembly uh, is, the, um, is the body that sets benefits and sets this uh, and, and puts those in the statutes and, and that's the purview of the legislature and uh, that while we've made recommendations um, you know again those decisions rest with you folks and uh, we believe that the task force uh, should be independent of the treasurer's office um, and that uh, we why we would be happy to testify that the trustees of the boards i'm sure would be happy to testify we'd be happy to provide information but this task force in the issue of what you are doing, um, bottom line is you should be the creator and the owner of the solution. And uh, um, so I would respectfully ask that the treasurer's office um, and or the retirement director be deleted from the members of the, um, of the, um, the, um, the task force. And again, that you be the creator and the owner of the solution. We will be there to provide uh, information as you need it. Uh, we will be there to, um, uh, 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 to certainly comment as we moved on, just as uh, other elective officers will, but um, uh, we, we feel very strongly about that. In addition to that, given the practical matters of our staffing and given the, um, the fact that, again, I believe that you are the owner of um, this, this solution and the owner of this process and it should be independent, um, I would uh, also want to make changes to this, uh, recommend changes to the section that says that we will be the administrative, technical, and legal support. Um, to the um, to the to the committee, I'm going to go back and with a uh, 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 not as serious as this stuff is. I remember going back in '09 and um, and uh, um, um, Steve Klein giving me a copy of the um, of the um, the draft bill where it said that the treasurer's office would staff it. I crossed it out and put JFO and sent back. And of course, he had last dibs on it. And you folks put the treasurer in there instead of uh, JFO. I think it's time, given that this should be independent of us. Uh, that it should be staffed by JFO. Um, when you talk about the legal issues, uh, number one, we had to hire a legal consultant because in the event that this, there was a lawsuit or there was any litigation around this, um, the AG would not be able to, uh, to provide um, legal support to this uh, uh, and have to maintain independence. The only, uh, our, our legal staff person in our office is an employee of the AG's office. So you would have to go out and get an RFP done for, for legal, um, 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 representation or, or, or consulting. Um, and uh, frankly, uh, we could issue it just as we did last time. Um, but uh, if the legislature is going to be taking the lead on this, you will likely, you know, Jeff O can issue an a, um, a RFP just as easy as we can. Then you get to interview the firms and you get to pick the one that you feel most comfortable working with. And I think that that would be um, a, a good, good um, um, step in terms of the legal consultation. I would recommend you do that sooner rather than later because procurement processes, as you know, take an awful lot of time. And uh, so I would, would recommend that. As far as the actuarial work, um, during the, uh, the, the last um, few months that you've been working through, looking at our report moving forward, you used the actuaries that we had, but you paid for those separately and the process was independent. And I would invite you to do the same thing in terms of those technical services. Now, we are going to have to have a hard conversation because I put everything we had on hold while you, the legislature did its, its process so that you vote, folks would have the priority time with our actuaries um, um, uh, so that you could uh, get your recommendations uh, out the door. Um, July, August, 
uh, tough time with our actuaries. So we would have to have some discussion about that. And maybe you would need to see, seek some other technical services elsewhere, but that's a problem because frankly, um, it gets, it, our system is complex and it would hard, be hard to get up to uh, speed with it. But we would, we could work that out. But you you would be paying for it separately. I saw it in the in the um, and uh, and you already have built a relationship uh, with JFO with our actuaries, so that we would think that uh, that technical skill could be supported uh, uh, through that process. You've got the legal cover that way. And from an administrative perspective, um, uh, JFO um, and um, uh, I forgot the other legislative body that supports uh, organization that supports uh, you folks. I think that they have the capability of providing that. Now, if you want our retirement director to come in and testify about benefits, we'd certainly be happy to have that. And um, and uh, any any representative or senator would, that would like me to talk about uh, DC versus DB, uh, I think that um, I, I I stand uh, with the employee groups and and stating again that DB is the best most cost-effective way uh, and best bang for your buck. And I'd be happy to come in and talk about that or any other pieces you would like. But I think we would rather be witnesses. We would rather be in a position where this is independent of our office and that, uh, um, that you would continue, as I say, as, as the, the body with the purview over benefits um, to be the creator and owner of the solution. Thank you, Treasurer Pierce. I appreciate you being with us. Um, let's give a moment to have any committee members who've got questions. Go ahead, Rep Gannon. So, um, thank you very much, um, Tom and Beth, for testifying this afternoon. Um, I appreciate it, and I appreciate all the hard work that you've put into this, um, especially um, the treasurer um, who's been working on this for months. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, just a couple of questions to, to Beth. Um, so I think the, the 2009 Retirement Commission had a outside um, law firm um, yes. do some research on yeah. our benefits. Yes. And so I think, you know, following that path is a good part. And I, I think that we contemplated that in this piece of legislation. Um, mm -hmm. Could you speak a little more to the challenge of working with Siegel, your current actuary, as, as we move forward, as a task force, I should say, moves forward? Um, because what you said did concern me a bit, because I think there is some urgency of getting this work done. Yeah, I agree there's urgency, and we're going to need to work through that. Um, uh, when we submitted the report to you, um, um, and I appreciate the months, it's actually been years that we've been working on this, these issues, but when we submitted the report to you in January, um, the, uh, the General Assembly wanted um, to take its own look at this independent of our office. Um, uh, you also recognize that getting an actuary up to speed on our system, and I will say again, that I've worked in the New York system, the Massachusetts system, the Connecticut system, um, and um, uh, we have the smallest of the systems that I've worked in and the most complex. I mean, it's as, it's as simple as that, but um, getting somebody up to speed would be difficult, so used our actuary. And at that point in time, we understood the speed at which you needed materials. So we said, we'll put our workload aside. Uh, the board that asked us to do some work, follow-up work off of our study, we put that aside. We're just getting that prepared and presented to the boards um, as we speak. Um, so we prioritized yours. We would have to have a long conversation with the actuary about what needs to get done on our end, what needs to get done on your end. It does not make sense for you to find, you could, you could hire a whole different actuarial firm, but by the time they get caught up to all the nuances of our system, going in and looking at our data, um, you know, and we'd have to go through all these confidentiality pieces uh, with that uh, anytime we've had an actuarial audit and we have done that. Uh, but we could certainly work with you. We would certainly prioritize that, but we also have to be able to close the system um, and produce evaluation. So we would we would need to work together on the timing of that. I could not guarantee as I did this last time and say, we'll put all of our work aside for the next three or four weeks, whatever that was, um, while you folks um, do your, your piece. Uh, we're just gonna have to work together on that. Okay, so if, if we coordinate, you believe that, that yes. it's likely we could get some access to the actuary? Uh, absolutely, we're gonna have to. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we um, uh, we can certainly help push their buttons on that. They're a good team. They're a very good team. 
um, and um, and they do good work. And uh, we've been very, very pleased with the uh, uh, the quality of their work. But uh, even as you folks said, can you get it done faster for your stuff as well as ours? There's just so many hours in a day that they can work. And they do have other clients too, but uh, I know that we're their favorite, but we'll go from there. And, and just another question. I mean, there, there's a huge sense of urgency of getting this done. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about the appropriate timeline for the task force to meet? Um, because I mean, you, you've been through this before. I yeah. have. Um, yeah. So I would appreciate your thoughts. Well, trying to get a report out from July 15th to September 1st, um, you know, you do have vacations. Uh, you do, I mean, it is, uh, we're just going to all be looking to meet relatives we haven't talked to in a very long time. Um, it's, so it's going to be on a personal level, folks are going to have to make some sacrifices. And with a group of 15 trying to schedule that during those months is going to be difficult. The work takes, I think that, you, you know, even if you looked at what you, you folks are trying to accomplish this year, it, it was a lot to accomplish in a very short period of time. Um, I have my doubts. That said, um, you folks can do fantastic work. And, um, you know, it, it, um, I would not try to say it can't be done, but it is a hard lift, um, you know, and we met with the, um, uh, we started this process, I said December, it was probably earlier, late November when we were meeting with folks on a regular basis. And so I had uh, in most weeks, not all, but in most weeks, four meetings a week, uh, two with the VSEA and the VTA and two with the uh, NEA. And so that was taking four separate meetings of our time, plus talking to actuaries, plus um, 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 working through issues with our staff. Um, uh, it's a lot of work. And uh, to get this done, um, uh, it's going to take that kind of commitment. It's tough. I'll leave it to you whether you folks believe it's doable. Um, and uh, but I would say that uh, it's a heavy lift. Thank you, Rep. Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also had a timeline question, but um, um, but specifically, Madam Treasurer. And, and given the eight distinct tasks that are laid out on page 19 of the bill and your intimate knowledge of that work, how much time would be needed? How many months do you think to, to, to do this well and, and to have a report that's meaningful and impactful? Um, I could go back and look um, on our web page, um, we have a, um, the, um, the final reports of the committee um, and uh, some of the starting points. Uh, as, we're, as we're talking, I'm going to try to pull those up. Um, it, um, um, how to say it, uh, it might take me a minute as we're talking, but um, it's, really, uh, it's really hard to gauge. Um, and uh, but if you let me come back to that question. I'm going to pull up on our web page the, uh, the commission materials itself and kind of look at what one of the intro reports were and when did we get to the final one, if, you, if that's okay. And give me a second to take a look at that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And in the meantime, if, you, if it's okay, I can do that and take another question if, uh, in the interest of time. If there is another question. Any other questions from committee members? Okay, so I'm looking, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead, Madam Chair. Um, no, 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 if you are, um, if you're ready to move on. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm trying to find one of the initial PowerPoints that I did. It, it's hard to believe that I would have done a PowerPoint. Um, <clears throat> I, I am taking a couple of shots at myself on this. Um, okay, so the, the agenda started I'm looking at the committee meetings and these were warned meetings. So we started on um, first commission meetings with July 14, 2009. And the final report was dated December of that year, I believe. Uh, give me one second here. Yeah, December. Uh, December of 2009. And then after that, Frankly, um, that uh, as, as uh, um, the treasurer Spalding used to say at the time, it was the beginning of the uh, of, of uh, the end of the beginning process or, or something along that line. I get it. The the bottom line is we ended up uh, coming to a an agreement, I believe, sometime around March 
um, because it was during the legislative session. And uh, um, so even though the committee had completed its work, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the work did spill into the, um, um, uh, into, I see one document that says um, our, our, our tentative agreement was 12810. So it, it, it got into that level. And then I do remember tweaking this right to the, um, um, to the end and during that legislative session. So I don't know if that's helpful for you in terms of timeline. And if that answers your question. Thank you so much. Rep Behovsky. Thank you. Um, Madam Treasurer, would you, and of course this is an opinion, but one of the challenges I know you brought up was that labor wasn't at the table the first time. Mm -hmm. Would you anticipate that bringing them to the table from the beginning would mitigate some of the, the time it took on the back, the, the far end of last time to come to an agreement? Theoretically, if we're all at the table building something together, we agree on it when that final report comes out. Um, I think it's helpful to have, uh, I think it would have helped. There's no doubt in my mind, uh, you know, I remember some of the meetings and uh, the periods of co public comment, and I think that that would, uh, would definitely have helped. I would point out that, again, we had numerous meetings with uh, the VSEA, the VTA, and the NEA, and while I have incredible respect for, um, for the folks, I was listening to Amy today, and I have to tell you, it's a pleasure. She may not agree with every, I think it was a pleasure to work with her, to be very candid, and the folks, but we didn't come to a conclusion. Um, and if we had, you folks probably would have been a little happier with us if we had given you a report that everybody was in an agreement in in January um, of this year. Um, so it doesn't guarantee the result. Um, but bringing people on at the front end is absolutely in an open process is absolutely um, uh, critical to the uh, to any success. Absolutely, <clears throat> we are. Uh trying to be very responsive to the suggestions that we've heard um, through the last um, months of this process. So, all right, any other questions from committee members? Rep Hooper. Uh, hey Beth, um, uh, Madam Treasurer. Uh, Beth is fine. You're gonna, you're gonna stick with that, so am I. Um, so information requests that are outstanding now, you've said a couple of times, the actuary is backed up. Do we have any idea when we're going to get like the breakdown of unfunded liability stuff and attributable plans, et cetera, et cetera? So the first request that uh, we've completed um, after we issued our report, the um, the actuaries, um, excuse me, the three, the two boards, the state and the teachers board asked us to prepare some materials, uh, some amortization schedules and looking how it impacted different groups. So if you took our recommendations and you put it, you know, on a 44 year old person who's going to retire, t you know, um, 10 years down the uh, 20 years down the road, what would that do the cost of living and, 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 and we've done those and we submitted the uh, a set of those to the um, uh, to the teachers board yesterday uh, for them to review and we're do, uh, and we're doing the next piece for the uh, for the um, uh, uh, for the um, uh, the state employees next week, and we're going to be presenting that material. That was the material we wanted to do on February 22nd. Uh, and again, we put it aside while the, uh, the, the General Assembly uh, completed its piece. I've had an initial discussion around the subsidy issue, um, a cross subsidization issue with, the, uh, with one of the actuaries. We have not put it into a project queue. If you still want us to do that, and that would be a request of, of the legislature, and um, uh, to just be candid on your dime, uh, you have put some money aside for, for, your, for your work and um, uh, uh, we would be happy to do that. But um, um, in as much as it's not a request of the boards, it would have to be funded through the dollars that the General Assembly put aside. I believe there are dollars available. I checked that the other day um, um, to do that. Um, but we would want a specific, what, do, what, what specifically are you looking at? Because I think that, um, when I look at the other information, um, uh, 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 the um, uh, uh, that was uh, that was done a few years ago. Um, frankly, um, I think I might have done that a little um, um, uh, different. Uh, and I do have to point out, there's one other piece that we asked the actuary to work on, which was some language around risk sharing. Um, and um, uh, that hasn't been submitted to us yet too. So we're still working a little bit on that. And there was another piece about um, 
if X number of people left, and that one's a very difficult one to do. It just, it's, it, we're having trouble even coming up with the, how that scenario would look at. So we're still trying to get some other projects done. We could certainly at the legislature, if you folks direct us, we will ask them to, um, to put, to prioritize that one ahead of other projects and, um, and get that done and define exactly what the scope of what you're looking for. And um, um, we would put that at the, at the front prioritization if that's what you want to do. I don't know about the legislature, but we talked about cost sharing this morning, and I don't think we can make a determination within the intricacies of the three state plans, or the four actually, since plan A is so active, uh, without knowing what the plans cost and what the attributable unfunded liability is in each plan. So, mm -hmm. and after this, I want to call you and talk to you about health care. So if you're available, I will. I'm, I'd be happy to talk about health care and to be very candid, um, since you gave me the opening. Um, I understand the task force and I understand uh, uh, the, um, the moving forward on that. I would still ask the House, the GovOps in, in, in the House to consider dealing with the issue of, um, of uh, OPEB funding this year. Uh, I was disappointed to see that the, the dollars and the, and the language was taken out of H315. Um, I thought the language should be stronger and not eliminated. And there's an opportunity here. You know, we sat here and said, how do we get here? Um, I think there, there, there clearly was messaging all the way along, but I do not want to be here 10 years from now saying, how did we get here with, uh, with uh, OPEBs? And I think that um, I, since you gave me the opportunity, uh, 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 Representative Hooper, I decided I'd, uh, I'd, I'd put that in. We need to continue to work and address that issue. I don't think there's anybody here that disagrees. Thank you. So your first choice would be for that to be on the table immediately. Yes. Uh, would you agree that the next best thing is that we should direct the task force to consider OPEB in the context of its summer study duties? I think that do, dealing with it now, uh, we're talking about a very small amount of money and a commitment to, to pre-funding, which is the type of discipline we should, we should have, would lower the state's liabilities by 1,680,000,000. And I think that um, putting that off into another legislative session would be a mistake. Um, if, if, if you make a mistake, how do you fix that mistake? You, you take it on the... Um, uh, I, I would say if you make a mistake and don't do it, that you don't do it at all would be a mis would, would be a bigger mistake. Um, so you would you would certainly need to 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 take a look at it. But it is a mistake not to deal with this now. Um, it is a um, a simple fix that has a big impact on our unfunded liabilities and our balance sheet. It's a it's a message about discipline. Uh, fiscal discipline and frankly, it protects us from getting down the road and saying we can't afford these benefits. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, it was that same process back in the 90s and, and early 2000s that, you know, uh, uh, that uh, we can't afford to do this now. Uh, we can't, um, uh, we'll catch up with this later. Um, you know, um, that mentality is what got us in trouble in the first place in the pension plans. And uh, I would urge the committee not to make that same mistake. And um, you know, we sent a memo to that effect several um, several weeks ago on this process. Um, um, I'm trying to remember the date, um, and I, I'd be happy to send it with another cover letter um, uh, uh, with our specific request that this be con re reconsidered for action this year. I think we can all find it um, on our committee page uh, to to go back and review it again. And I guess uh, what I need to make sure folks understand who are maybe tuning into this conversation from afresh and haven't been a part of all of the conversations leading up to this is that when we have an ADEC uh, bill that is that comes to the legislature that we must pay that is ballooning um, with you know, a $96 million increase over last year, um, that is a, a, an extremely difficult time to be considering also obligating ourselves to, um, to pre-fund the post-employment benefits absent of some sort of action that would uh, try to curb the rate of growth of the ADEC payment. And so that's why we're putting all of these issues together uh, to solve at the same time, because honestly, uh, the chair of appropriations would 
uh, would chase me out of her room if I were to go to her and say, I need, oh, I, by the way, I need an extra hundred million for, uh, for the ADEC and I need more for OPEB. Um, it's just, uh, it's well, Madam Chair, to be exact, you need about 40 million to do both the teacher and the state OPEB um, and, and a policy that's in, in place in statute, 41 million and change to be exact. And you could do the, uh, the teacher one, which is in a very good shape, ready to go um, with uh, uh, 20 million. And we could even work it to reduce that um, uh, uh, a bit further if necessary. But uh, we, we worked through the protocols. We worked through the modeling with the actuaries. Um, we're not, you know, in the, in the scope of things, this is um, uh, money that uh, is manageable to do a big thing and that secures people's health care moving forward. It lowers our liabilities. Um, and uh, I'm reminded of a joint fiscal memo from 1989 that explained that the reason we should not do um, uh, pre-funding or we should uh, not fu fully fund the ADEC for the pensions was because that... Um, a, investments were going to solve the whole problem, which we uh, is obviously not going to be the case in, in any environment, and B, that we can't afford these with all of our pro other programming needs. And that was a step that took us down the road, the, down the path of uh, a lack of discipline, and I would prefer not to, I would recommend that we not uh, repeat those mistakes. So thank you. I, I believe that we share the objective of uh, getting to a pre-funded um, OPEB benefit. Uh, Rep Vihovsky. Thank you. I have two questions. One is sort of related to this healthcare piece. And while I certainly want to ensure that everyone has health care, when we're looking at this as a whole picture, would you agree that we also need to look at better ways of administering health care to find health care savings? I mean, our rate of health care cost growth in Vermont is astronomical compared to the rest of the U.S. and the U.S. is astronomical compared to the rest of the world. So do you think that that needs to be part of this picture? Well, absolutely. We sent a memo um, back in September um, to the um, to the uh, um, the House, uh, and it identified a three point plan with respect to um, to uh, the teachers' plan in particular. One was the a path toward prefunding. Second was to take a look at our claims experience versus the national trends, because when the actuaries do work on um, on developing your liabilities, they tend to use national uh, trend rates. And our claims experience um, in both the state and the teachers, but particularly the teachers system, which has had a, a long uh, articulated wellness program for a number of years. And I have to give um, the state HR department uh, a lot of um, um, kudos as well, because they've developed a great deal of that over the, over the most recent years. But our claims experience is better than the national trend. So as you, you talk about the cost of healthcare, our retiree health claims are, are um, experience has been better than, than those national trends. So we actually ended up working with them to, to get at least some of that into the equation, lower the liabilities by about 25 million for that. Um, this, again, the change in, um, in, in pre-funding would be 1.6 billion, a big piece of that. We also identified in, um, in, uh, as a third component that we would be looking at uh, ways to change the contractions, uh, contractual processes as we looked at healthcare without changing benefits. And I wanna be very clear. And I think we've got a path forward. Uh, we should be able to announce something on that fairly soon. I, 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 I don't wanna do any more than that at this point in time, but we think we have a path forward to, to lower those, uh, those costs uh, without changing the benefits. Um, and just uh, for the record, um, in the past, we've done a number of, of, of things there. We, we went to something called EGWIP, Employer Group Waiver Plan, which is a way we structure our, our prescription benefits with the federal government. That's taking in, um, uh, uh, it, it started with four, $4 million a year. I think we're up someplace uh, around $7 million a year of, of, of um, dollars coming in to pay for some of those things. Uh, we changed, uh, we created a tiered structure, uh, so you had to work longer, and this was with the, with the um, employee groups on both uh, the state and teacher side, uh, that uh, you had to work longer to get a subsidized benefit, and that um, lowered the liabilities considerably at the time. And to the administration's credit, in 2018, they made some contractual changes on the state health care system. The retiree health care for the state and the state employees, the current employees, they're linked together. It's one big plan, as opposed to the teacher plan where we work separately from the, the statewide active uh, teachers. Uh, and they made some changes there that lowered the liabilities um, by about 230 million in 2018. So I wanna commend the administration for that. 
clearly we're working on the liability side and we hope to bring to you um, uh, an announcement uh, that we will have some changes in those liabilities as we move forward um, because we will continue to we look at both sides of the equation. Great. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, my other question, I, I hear that you feel pretty strongly that we need to invest in prefunding OPEB as soon as possible. Would you, what are your thoughts on the need to invest in, in any additional monies into that unfunded liability sooner rather than later? The longer we wait, um, the, the larger the problem becomes. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we need to, you know, take advantage of that. I took a look at a chart um, the other day that um, years ago, I went back to the old actuarial reports back to 1979, put, dusted them off and put some numbers together. And I looked at the interest rates and the investment returns. And I, I, I sent a copy of this chart to Tom the other day. And, uh, and he had the same comment that I did. Um, uh, where we had really in very high inflation rates and, 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 and investment return rates was, you know, in the late 80s and into the 90s up to about 2000. And I would remind you from 1990 to, um, to 2007 was the period of time when we did underfund the system. And if you look at the returns that we had back then, um, and put them into context. And those returns are driven by national. I mean, if you take a look at the rates of inflation back then, I mean, uh, I remember um, uh, double digit inflation um, back in the 80s. If you take a look at that, the opportunity um, loss on that money. Now, I, I remembered in your, in your, in your public hearings uh, that there was, uh, I think it was a school teacher and um, uh, 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 I think he should be a math teacher based on his skill set there. And he took a look at the, um, the, um, uh, the, the interest earnings that would have been made on those dollars. Now, I would disagree with a couple of pieces of that because of the nuances of how the ADEC is uh, computed and how you amortize the unfunded liability. But his thesis was well taken. We had an opportunity there and we blew it. Okay. Um, so we don't want to blow opportunities here. We want to be taking care of business as quickly as we can for the benefit of everybody in the system. And uh, you know that's the urgency of which we uh, try to put our our recommendations forward. Uh, we'll continue to be you know partners in this thing. But again, as far as the study is concerned, this is the study of the legislature. That is clear in the focus, and we think that the the staff support to it. Uh, you have available the resources. We've talked that through. Uh, that, um, but we are willing to provide our technical um, expertise as witnesses in the process. Um, but um, um, Delay is not a good thing. Uh, when you've got a crisis, putting it off isn't, isn't what I would recommend. I would add, let me add to that too, because I, uh, I took best numbers because she sent them to me this week and I ran them through the actual return. So I know what that opportunity cost actually is for every year since 1979. And it's, it's staggering to know. So I would strongly recommend at least whenever you can add more and because it minimizes the, the effect. I'll just give you an example. 13.9 million underfunded in 1992 would have turned into 109 million with the actual VPIC results from that period in the teacher's plan. So it's, it's material and you add them up each of these years. I know they're individual decisions each year, but they're significant. Thank you so much. But Treasurer Pierce, I think he was a math teacher. That's is fine. <laughs> That's is fine, please. Um, yeah. I hope he is a math teacher because he did a nice job. Yeah, I think he was. And lastly, I'm just curious if either of you have thoughts on, and, and I know you weighed in a lot on the VPIC earlier and I kind of waited till the end, but would you say that it is the fault of employees on the VPIC that it has underperformed or that that is a combination of many factors? So I want to do, uh, want to point a few things out on that. And I, um, um, so I, when I went back to 1979, I had to take a couple of those years out because um, I was missing a few, um, a few of the, um, the binders uh, from the 79 period. So I took it from 1983 on and took a look at the rate of return assumption and the, um, and the, um, and the, the number of times that we exceeded it and the number of times that uh, we did not. And, um, and uh, I was, um, uh, kind of interesting and in, in taking a look at this. So out of that whole period from 19, I think that's 1983 to 2020, um, uh, the investments, now this is the teacher system because um, they, at that point, investments were separated by group back in the 80s, um, but they had similar processes and similar, um, similar structures. 
But um, uh, 24 out of 38 um, um, data points, uh, the, uh, the, um, the rate of return assumption, uh, uh, the investment yield actually exceeded the rate of return assumption. And I took a look at the last 20 years. So the last 10 years, so from 2011 to 2020, um, the uh, VPIC exceeded the assumed rate of return five out of those 10 years. Um, in the previous 20 uh, 10 year periods, so over that, uh, the same thing. So over the last 20 years, um, 10 times over, 10 times under, which, you know, in a, in a market um, uh, cycle uh, is um, not entirely unexpected. The real shame is, as I said, that period of time when, when we were underfunding, that's when we had, you know, some incredibly high interest rates um, out there in the markets and, and, and lost that advantage. So I think that, uh, uh, you know, that it's performed, it hasn't missed the mark in that way. Uh, it has not been everything that we would want it to be. And, um, uh, and I'm, I'm clear on that, which is why I think, and I give Tom a ton of credit, and that's why I think he should, uh, uh, we should be able to have some more opportunity in terms of salary for him or future folks, because you want the quality uh, of the person in there that uh, can, uh, can, can uh, you know, um, be at the helm of this. Um, uh, we, we, we turned the ship around in many ways. I think that our, um, uh, our structure was overcomplicated. I think that um, uh, it did not perform as well in all market cycles. And I think that we've got um, a good mix now of upside and downside protection. Um, I think that we take more advantage of, um, of uh, index funds instead of active management where it's appropriate. So I would say that, yes, it could have been better. We learned from our experience and we put together something that I think is um, uh, very, very good. And I give um, both um, uh, Tom and uh, our current CIO, um, uh, uh, Eric Henry, and uh, Matt Considine, who um, uh, was transitioning into that period as we, uh, as we move forward and made these changes. And they all did good work. Um, we learned from it, we built on it. The difference, in, and I, I think moving forward, is we, A, we want to build on success. That's why we want to make the changes that we're talking about in creating an independent body. And you may not have an Eric. You may not have a Tom in the future. Um, you know, you may have a, a treasurer who does not have um, 40 years of experience in um, in government finance. You want to be having. You want to have a VPIC that can stand the test of, of of those changes and have the appropriate checks and balances. Which is why we wholeheartedly agree with the changes that we're talking about um, in in the. Um, in the, uh, uh, the current uh, uh, proposal that's out there, uh, version 1.1, I believe that you have out there. We think it's a good proposal because it builds on success. It, make, it helps us move forward from the, the things that we have made mistakes on and move forward and done a better job and reflected on that and, 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 and put those into, into a new structure and create that uh, checks and balances so that we continue to grow and not, uh, and not go backwards. So I think it's uh, all in all a very good um, uh, good piece of work, and we're proud of being part of that. And we appreciate the uh, the opportunity um, to um, uh, to weigh in on that. Um, it, it's an understatement to say we weren't real fond of the initial proposal, but I think we're in we're in the right direction. Um, and again, what I would say to you is uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. You know, there were, um, when I look at the um, at the uh, the chart that I sent to uh, Tom. And uh, you look at the, um, the periods of time uh, and we have market disruptions all the way through. Um, you know, you have um, in the early 80s, you had um, record high inflation uh, rates and treasure three, uh, 30 year treasury rates. Uh, then in um, uh, October 19th, 19, October 19, 1987. And again, John, I'm not sure. I, I was working when this was happening. Uh, there's a, you know, if you take a look at the, uh, the front page of either the Times or the Wall Street Journal back then, this, this look of a very frazzled analyst looking up at the, um, at the, uh, at the uh, screen as the, um, as the stock market took an incredible um, um, uh, uh, plummet down. Uh, then you see the, the, the dot-com crash. You see the Great Recession. Uh, we've had the disruption with the, um, the um, um, uh, in 2015, with um, the um, uh, uh, the meltdown of the uh, uh, the, the uh, Chinese markets and the impact it had on on um, on, um, uh, on markets across the uh, the world, uh, the uh, 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 the uh, Brexit, and then uh, of course uh, COVID. So as you take a look at this, uh, you know markets have been much more volatile of late. But I think you have to build a portfolio that that 
performs in these markets. We had some glitches. I think we've learned from them. We've moved forward. I think that we're in the right direction now. Um, thank and you. This brings it the next step forward in terms of success. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I've got three more hands up. Um, and it is Friday afternoon on a lovely day. We've had a long week in front of the Zoom. So let's see if we can uh, fly through the last few committee questions. Um, Rep Hooper. Madam Chair, I appreciate getting the lightning round. Uh, uh, this is important stuff though. So lightning round, Beth. Um, how much money is in the current OPEB fund? Roughly. Okay, in the uh, state system, um, um, I um, believe it's a, an excess of 50 million. I, I know that I've got one staff person who's gonna be uh, okay. texting me right now. Whoa, whoa, uh, that, that's right. fine, that's fine. But um, when, we, when, yeah. we did the, when we did the adjustment in 2009, I believe I have on my floor here a memo from our friend Cynthia Webster that said if we implemented that staged, uh, it would save us $309 million. Is that a number that rings in your head? Um, and where did that money go? Sure. Uh, it, it saved on the liabilities, I believe. So let me go back. Uh, when we made the tiered structure in 2000, uh, 2010 or 11 for the state's teacher system, uh, it right up front, it lowered the liabilities by over $100 million. The big problem we still had was, as you recall, um, uh, that, uh, and, and by the way, the 2009 commission um, pointed out that the, uh, that, um, the failure to appropriate uh, uh, the, the dollars needed to pay even the current premiums uh, kept being added to the credit card um, uh, was, was, uh, was adding to the unfunded liabilities. Uh, we changed that in 2014 uh, um, uh, with a recommendation from our office that the uh, the General Assembly adopted. That changed, that saved the taxpayers about $480 million, okay, um, uh, between 2010 and 2038, and it's on target. Um, I don't have the $300 million figure in front of you that uh, Cynthia, and for the record, Cynthia Webster was the uh, previous um, um, Director of Retirement Operations. Um, that doesn't sound off what I would have expected with the tiered changes that we made. Okay, thank you. Tom, um, previous two things, quick ones. Mm -hmm. Previous uh, director of uh, investments uh, has been following VPIC uh, still, and he submitted testimony, I guess you would call it, or maybe a letter to this group that said he would attribute 10% of the unfunded liability to VPIC controlled or influenced actions? Question one. Questions two, can you address the fact that we are now positioned so that we lose less in a down market than we make in an up market as, as a strategic sort of positioning? Because uh, you know there's been a lot said about us failing um, and you can't look at up without looking at down. Thank you. Uh I'll start with the first one, Matt. I spoke to a couple of days ago just to get his opinion, and I did get his his spreadsheet. Um, Matt was wonderful at spreadsheets, and I think I would take his spreadsheets over anything with some of these. So, historical records when he was there would would I'd lend a lot of credence to that. You know, whether or not it's exactly ten percent or if it's fifteen percent or what it works out to be, I guess uh, it's all dependent on the date when you when you value things, and and so. I'd, I'd leave that up to the Joint Fiscal Office or, or uh, you know, financial experts and actuaries to evaluate that. In regards to the, the characterization of the up-down market, I think it's a perfect example of what we've accomplished over the past year um, that highlights what we've, we've done. And, and it shows a market that dropped 30% with COVID crisis last February and um, then recovered. Um, you can look at the fact that we were in the top 30 percentile versus our peers before COVID. And now we're in top 19 percentile versus our peers after the recovery to tell you that exact answer that we did better in the downturn and we did just as well in, in the recovery. And I think that's what we've structured our portfolio to do. And I think that answers your question. We have, we do have an eye on liabilities. We have an eye on cash flow. Um, there's significant you know, trying to make it not complex, but also not to get caught in in problems because losses are 
harder to make up. And, and uh, I think we've really attempted to do that. And I think this past year has shown that, that to be the case. Thank you. Representative McCarthy. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, Treasurer Pierce, um, I was a little confused by your response to Representative Vihovsky, and I just want to clear something up for, for folks who are watching outside, because I feel like there's been a lot of conflating of different things in mm -hmm. all of the political rhetoric outside of our committee uh, surrounding these conversations. So my question is, is it true that it's a very different thing for us to hold off a few months and make sure we're spending additional money above and beyond the ADEC to prefund OPEB, set us on a course, a glide path to, to have that liability, which we did discuss in this committee and I really believe in prefunding. I wanna take your recommendation on that. There, that there's a big difference between holding off on that and reserving all of those additional funds over and above the ADEC and the historic underfunding of the ADEC that you spoke about. I, I just, I really want people at home to hear, to hear that there's a big difference in that because I feel like we as a legislature, we got the ADEC, it was an extra $96 million this year over last year, and we put it in the budget, we're funding it. And then when I heard your comments, I took them to mean, oh, if you don't fund the OPEB, you're doing the same thing that your predecessors did in the 90s back when I was in high school. <laughs> I mean, I, I just want to be I just want to be really clear that, like, we're not doing that. We are funding the ADEC. We also are talking about putting extra money in and we want to make sure that we have buy in from stakeholders, from other legislators, that this additional money we're talking about putting into our future goes into the right bucket. So I just, I want to make yeah. a real clear distinct, distinction. I want to make sure I'm not confused. And so I just wonder if you agree yeah. with my assessment of that. Okay. Well, I'm, um, uh, I'm struck by the fact that you were in high school back then. I had uh, graduated from college and was well into my career at that point in time. So we'll just leave it at that. But, um, um, and uh, I was in my career when I was looking at the, uh, the October, 1987 uh, debacle in the markets. And, um, but um, I think that there are a couple of pieces of this. Number one, I do not, uh, I very much appreciate the fact that you're tackling these issues and you're taking a look and you're moving forward. Um, and uh, and I, at least that is my hope that we'll move forward. I do want to point out that, um, you know, we brought these issues up in, in, um, with, the, with the respect to, um, to health care. Let's go back to the OPEB and, and teacher health care. Um, I must have written um, at least one memo a year to uh, to the House as they were looking at the budget to get out from under um, the, the fact that we weren't even funding the premium payments. We were putting them on our credit card. So as I said to you folks earlier that uh, in 2012, um, I think the bill was someplace around 24 million, the premiums, and they appropriated 20, um, uh, excuse me, appropriated four, left the other 20 million without having been appropriated. It was a sub fund of the pension plan. So essentially it created more losses in the pension plan um, and that uh, and asked each year um, all the way out to 2014, we finally, um, uh, it was part of the 2009 report, by the way, when I was a deputy treasurer. So and Madam I, treasurer I don't mean to interrupt you and I'm, I'm so sorry to do that, but I just, I just want to make it clear for folks who can't, quite follow what, yeah. what we've been following for the last few weeks that there's a that there's a difference between the historic underfunding of the ADEC and us not having yet made not, the decision to I commit ourselves that. to the yeah. OPEP I think right. is what you're trying to say that's exactly yes. where I was going Madam Chair thank you okay. so let me just try so I, I appreciate that I guess what I'm trying to say is it took a long time to to get to the point where action was taken so I'm cognizant of the time it takes when we define a problem. Um, and, and, and we've been at this for a very long time. In 2019, we started a risk assessment process around this very issue. And we brought in the employee groups. We brought in uh, members of this, this committee. We brought in members of the legislature. The speaker was involved. And as I said um, um, in previous testimony, um, that did not happen. Um, back then. In 2000, we did a report and that hasn't happened. We put, we put it off. And my problem is that will we have the will to do all that is necessary down the road? I don't have any doubts of sincerity. Okay. I have no doubts of sincer about the sincerity of everyone to try to get this done. 
my question is, um, will we have the will to get it all done? And for me, right now, there's an opportunity to do the OPEB. Let's do one to demonstrate that will and then move forward uh, with the rest of this package. I, I don't disagree with you at all, uh, Madam Treasurer. And if I, I could just follow up with a question that might sound rhetorical, but yeah. won't it be easier to the chair's point earlier for us to find that will if we reduce the other ballooning expenses and, and have a path forward that allows us more flexibility in where we make all of our funding decisions across all of the buckets. I think that that, that um, uh, is one path. And I think that another path is to work with us now to try to find a solution in this, this fiscal year. And we can work on how to prioritize that and get as much done this year with the dollars that are available this year. I was very disappointed that the $20 million that was uh, put into three, uh, uh, H315 was uh, ultimately um, uh, uh, removed as well as the language. Let's work on it. Let's find a path forward. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I got a, a couple questions for Tom and then hopefully we can sort of move on. Um, uh, Tom, there's been a couple comments made here this afternoon. Um, about somehow people are assigning uh, responsibility or blame to the non-professionals on VPIC, mm -hmm. in particular, the, the plan beneficiaries. And um, that was never stated and that was never said that way. The questions have been in relationship to what does their perspective, how does it contribute to the overall earnings of the plan? And I think the the one of the questions was those that are non-professionals. Um, I would have to say you as an example, and I guess Eric and some others, um, it's pretty clear that you are the right people at the right time and the right positions. Because obviously since what, 17, 18, um, we are on a trajectory towards where we'd wanna be. But the question is, is on the investment side, on the VPIC side, wouldn't we be better off to have people that have the skill sets that you need in that regard? And the last question I would have is, can you give me the downside on what it would be to totally professionalize the investment side? And yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. I, I find um, non-professionals to be of tremendous value on the investment committee. Um, whenever you get a bunch of investment professionals in a room, sometimes they think they're smarter than they are. And I've found that you have really good balance when you have a mix of professionals and non-professionals. So I wouldn't, and, and also I'd say, and I wouldn't place any blame on prior actions. We've had, we've had professionals advising us. I'd almost place the blame on lack of investment in an infrastructure for VPIC that has caused us to rely on financial experts more than we should have from the local perspective. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, what we're doing and what we're moving towards is really localizing it and, and having non-professionals and professionals as a mix. I don't think, I think you need them. I just don't need you think to make them all members. Hopefully that answers it. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, absolutely. Madam Chair, if I could follow up on one point about this, if it, I know that everybody wants to get out on Friday, but if I, if you indulge me one more here. So I came to the state treasurer's office as a deputy in 2003, okay? And um, in 2003, when I arrived, there was uh, one person uh, who was uh, uh, the responsibility for the investments of the pension fund. He was also responsible for the debt issuance for the state. So he was a debt and investment director. And because they thought he would have not enough to do, uh, they also made him the director of the bond bank. Okay. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, that was just not workable. So the first thing we did is we, um, a few uh, after that um, was uh, deemed as a little more than somebody could handle, they moved it off and the bond bank became its own entity again. And, um, and and now has a professional staff as well as a director. Or some I don't remember how many other staff, but they do. Um, and uh, um, and that person was now in charge of um, um, investments in debt, issuing the the state's bonds. 
Um, that continued for a while um, into another individual. Eventually, we were able to, um, um, uh, uh, just before I became treasurer, they were able to split the function. So the, uh, we now have one person doing investments, okay? Since that time in our budget, we've asked for additional people. So we now have three people in the office uh, full-time working on, on, on investments. Um, I used to say when I was in front of the Appropriations Committee, we should have at least one person for every five billion, uh, for every billion we have. Uh, we've got five billion, so a couple of people behind on that. Um, but I think that we have been moving in the right direction, but we were trying to do this uh, uh, without putting the necessary resources historically behind this. We now have the right resources. Uh, we have the right teams to be able to do this. Um, and, um, and we need to apply additional resources as we need it. You cannot um, get the type of return you need if you don't have the, st um, the staff and the uh, 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 internal resources to do that. You do need, and I will agree wholeheartedly with Tom, uh, that corporations, by the way, you see studies, corporations do better when they have a, a mix on the board, uh, diversity on the board. You need to have that same thing here, but you also need to have the resources in place, the staff in place, the types of folks that you need to get this done. And clearly we're in a lot better shape than we were in back in 2003 with somebody doing three jobs. So I am so thankful that we've had a, a thorough conversation here about, uh, about how we're moving forward, about um, BPIC's perspective um, on, uh, on modernizing itself, uh, if for lack of a better term, or um, refreshing, <clears throat> refreshing the, the way you, you are built as an organization. Um, so the document that you have shared with us, Tom, I uh, very much appreciate, and we will uh, take a closer look at that over the weekend um, and come back to uh, a fresh look at the bill language on uh, Tuesday when we get back into, uh, into session. And so I guess I, I just want to ask if there are any other committee members who have questions either for Tom or Beth before we sign off. Thank you. Thank you, Vogue. Uh, Have a good weekend. Thank you very much. I like the scene behind you, Madam Chair. It's a very, uh, it's something to think about for the weekend. It, it, we can all wish that it was that green out there right now, but at least the sky is uh, equally as blue. Thank you. Take, take care. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you all. Uh, that is it for the day.